Lockie, welcome <laughs> to the James Smith Podcast. Thanks, bro. Thanks for having me. Uh, welcome to the My Muscle Project Studio. That's, that is pretty good. So uh, for our listeners, Lockie has just illuminated his sign because we're in his studio, um, which is going to be part of the introduction. I suppose this is a cool sign. I'm pretty <laughs> jealous. Uh, hopefully the camera doesn't pick it up. Uh, would you go orange sign or would you go blue sign? Like what's your color? Because, you know, originally you were orange and now you're more blue. So we've we got Academy branding, which is purple, mm. which I never knew how much color was important. Huge, bro. Mate. It's your brand. So orange, uh, funnily enough, that T-shirt was originally red. Yeah. But I think that I was a, uh, they turned my saturation down a bit. Because I, I go red quite easy. So I'm in front of cameras, there's hot lights. So they've turned down my saturation to make a red T-shirt look orange. And then that became brand. So question is, the two are the two um, covers, are they the same photo shoot, but just photoshopped the no, color the of the shirt? Completely different photo shoots. Okay. One was in the UK, in the News Corp building. The, <laughs> it feels like I'm on your podcast now. <laughs> I can't uh, help it, bro. I just ask questions. And then the second one, the blue one, that was uh, when we got out of lockdown. So okay. I keep forgetting that we locked down for quite a few weeks here uh, in Australia because it was the first time I'd been in a room with 10 strangers for maybe four or five months. So when I went to the photo shoot... The oh, at the photo shoot, you said? Yeah, in yeah, Sydney. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh my God, there's other people here. Yeah. And uh, it, it was kind of a weird one because they said to me, we want you to have a blue T-shirt. And I was like, the blue you're after doesn't really exist on a T-shirt. So mm. they went to AS Color and mm. proved me wrong. Yeah. Banging T-shirts. Everything. Every color. Uh, but in the end, here's a spinball for you. This is the T-shirt from the book two cover. That's a blue shirt. They made it blue yeah. in Photoshop. Because yeah. I, I love a Lululemon t-shirt. I think they just fit well. Yeah, yeah. This, I could wear this on a night out. Yeah, yeah. Or I could wear this right now on a podcast. Didn't you wear that on the boat? Uh, I probably did, yeah. Yeah. A breathable yeah. tea. Yeah. says on formal, but Strategy. I need to party. Um, so for any listeners or viewers, uh, we originally met Lockie because I came on your podcast mm. twice now. We were trying to figure out that timeline the other day because it was confusing. We are competing as to who had the busiest year. At one point. I've got that. In my my show notes has 10 things, right? And I think two of them you've already brought up before you even got into it. So you, you're a more experienced podcaster than I am by quite a significant amount. Mm. So you've got a very successful podcast. And I'm going to say it out there straight away that the headsets we use, the setup that I now have for doing podcasts that have allowed me to do podcasts on the go in Sonny's car, at Sonny's house, at my house. I had to do your podcast. And then at the end of it, I was like, boys. How, mm. how can I do this? <laughs> yeah. How can I get this? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you guys helped me out with the tech, tech specs. Yeah. You're, you're always a few steps ahead of me. Yeah, well, we weren't. So this was going back six years in October when we started it. But the first setup that we had, because we had no money back then. This is us living in the gym, eating sweet potato from like, you know, microwaving raw sweet potato, this sort of thing. So we went to, we went with a credit card. So we didn't even have the money. We went to a uh, a store which is now called, it's still around, it's called Store DJ. I think you went to the store. Alexandria. Yeah, but before that, it was smaller. It was like a room like this. It was a tiny little thing. And I went in there and I go, I'm doing a podcast. What do you recommend? And he said, what's a podcast? That's how long it was. He didn't know what it was. Yeah. So he goes, so I had to explain to him. I'm like, oh, it's a radio show. He goes, okay, so you're in a studio or whatever? I go, no. He goes, well, what recording equipment do you already have? I go, I've got a laptop. And he goes, oh, shit. Okay, well, Rode, just a Rode, which is like the biggest podcasting brand. They got like the podcast, the pro kit. They got everything now. They, they, all they had back then was a Rode. Their newest thing was the Rode lapel, which sticks straight into your phone because I wanted the cheapest thing possible. Stick straight into your phone and that was a microphone and it would just clip onto you. It was a lapel mic. Like an auxiliary and then you just do a voice note. Kind That's of. it, voice memo. But the Rode app when you recorded it through the road app, it was much better than if you did voice memo on your phone for whatever reason. Some some calculation through the app makes the sound process a lot better. Anyway, so, but the problem with the app, we didn't realize was it crashed a lot. The problem with the app crashing is you lose a show halfway through it without realizing because your phone switches off, right? The screen goes dark and you just assume it's recording. So there were a, fir there were a couple shows in there in the beginning, like I'm... Um, talking the first 15 shows where we do a whole show hour and a half and this is when we did all in person meet up and this is convincing people to come on a podcast and at the in the same breath telling them what a podcast is and they would rock up and we'd finish the show and i go my, my app crashed Rafa go, my app crashed check the other one. Oh, the app didn't crash so we would we would go there because each each mic needed its own phone so we were yeah. using the guest phone and so we'd have to get the audio file and then in the background noise of the one that didn't crash is bring up the sound of all the other podcasts. So we had one mic that survived out of three 
and then we'd use the background noise of us talking the questions. So imagine if my mic died now <laughs> and then I had to use my sound through your mic. So you'd find like the tiny little sound of me speaking and you'd have to pull it up. So you'd edit the whole thing. It was a disaster. That's where we started. You've had a lot of guests though. Like on, on the walls, because we're using your studio at the moment and uh, you've kindly said that I can use it for some of the podcasts moving forward. Um, there's a hundred podcasts you have on the wall. So even just your, is this what your first year? Yeah, that's the first. Well, that was one a week. So that's a hundred weeks. All right, fuck. So the, your first two years up on the wall, more podcasts than I've I've done or probably ever listened to. <laughs> and some of your guests are, are very impressive. Uh, that's only, well, yeah, the first hundred. Who would yeah. you say were, if, it's, it's horrible to ask this question, but what were your favorite podcasts? It is a, it is a hard question. The, I think at the end of the day, it really just depends on like who you're speaking to. So like if someone says, oh, who's your favorite podcast? And I might tell them, it's, it's a nothing conversation if I tell them a bunch of people they've never heard of. So like... What topics were, were they? The, there must have been some topics that you had where you were blown away. You brought someone in and you're like, oh, we're going to talk about hydration. Mm. Oh, it'd be cool. And then you, you leave and you're like, oh my God. A mm. bit like when, when everyone read uh, Why We Sleep, Matthew Walker. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, we're going to read a little book on sleep. Mm. The next thing you Mind come out, you're like, guys, <laughs> we're living life wrong. Yeah, and everyone's yeah. pulling stats out the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, so I guess our version of that Probably the first one was Patrick McEwen. He's got a book called the, or he's got a course called the Oxygen Advantage. Basically, he does he has two businesses. The first business is um, he helps Olympians with breath and breath work and breathing and all that sort of stuff, sports performance. And the second one is he works in the dental industry and he helps reconfigure jaw lines and nasal passages and all that stuff for people who snore and have jaw issues or whatever. And I just went into it thinking, oh, we're going to talk about Wim Hof, you know, we're going to talk about nose breathing, we're going to talk about, you know, sitting there in an ice bath and that sort of stuff. And he broke down the science of why Wim Hof is not bullshit, but everything that he credits, the reason it working, he goes, it works, but not for the reasons that he thinks. He goes, but here's the real science. So it was kind of like, it was, it was if like the, the, the older dad or the professor came in for breath work and said, okay, yeah, there's all these little fads out here, there's this crazy Russian guy and there's this guy over here and there's this American guy but here's how it's really laid out I think he's Irish and he just he just blew us away that was in terms of like when it comes to health and fitness that was like one of the best podcasts we've done do you know what it's interesting where uh, quite a lot of people uh, I had some work done to my teeth about two years ago um, in London in Harley Street I went to um, see a very good very good dentist there um, Harley Street Smile called um and let me double check that actually. <laughs> they're, they're actually amazing. I thought you had them. I thought you did the work here. Smart, in Australia. Nah, smart by design are the people I used here. But um, Harley, yeah, Harley Street Smart on Insta. Uh, they've, that's not a paid post or anything. I'm trying, it's actually probably some of the best customer service I've ever had. Mm. Because a year ago, or just over a year ago, I broke <laughs> the teeth they did for me in jiu-jitsu with a mouth guard in. Oh, I took a knee to the mouth really hard. I shot a single leg. And as the guy fell on his butt, put his knee up to guard mm, mm. my face went into it and we all heard a pop and everyone stopped so i pulled out my mouth guard and at the time i was worried that my teeth were going to be in it but i pulled out and my teeth were completely fine so then you know when you tongue your teeth yeah yeah i was like where did panic the, where did the pop come from <laughs> so i was like all right uh so then i was like guys i think i'm done and uh with Darren, like Darren was like probably call you whatever we had a shower afterwards then we went to nando's and i found a shard of veneer in my food oh, and shit. then I started tonguing my teeth and I realized I cracked my bridge so I have a bridge in the front and uh, a bridge so uh, when I was younger I had crooked teeth and is I, that the wire uh, no 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 a bridge is just a flat veneer plate oh okay so I had uh, one tooth that was a real big problem and I hate metal on my teeth this is it this, I haven't really spoken about this in the podcast. I hate metal on my teeth I can't even bite a fork when someone bites a fork mm, I'm I like, hate that as well yeah oh. I'm like can you stop please doing that <laughs> so I went to the dentist and I was like look I don't want metal on my teeth but I want straight teeth and they were too crooked for Invisalign so he goes it's a bit extreme but I could remove the tooth that's causing the problem we could put a bridge in so mm. I was like let's do that and then I had it redone a few years ago and uh, first time I had it done it didn't cost me a lot. I was in a very average paid job, but I was in recruitment. I was actually thinking that, I think I was only 22 at the time, but I was quite well aware that having a straight smile makes you more trustworthy. Mm. Like I thought that from uh, yeah, an anecdotal standpoint, but then when you look at studies, people that are better looking serve less jail time. So convictions for guilty, not guilty, aren't affected by how good looking you are, but the severity of your punishment is uh, correlated with how good looking you are. Mm. So then I was thinking, 
if I can become more trustworthy and have straighter teeth, I might be able to do more business. This is going to pay for itself. Mm -hmm. This is 22. My brain's thinking this. So at 20, uh, 28, I said to Darren, I said to a lot of my friends, I was like, I'm getting my teeth done again. Mm. And everyone was like, nah, what are you doing? And in my head, what I What do you mean again? So I already had a bridge. Oh, so I was okay. gonna have a bridge done again. Right. I was actually worried about um the the way it was fitting. Uh I was I could there was a bit of air that could get through it and I was paranoid that if air could get in there, food could get in there, and I'm really paranoid. Mate, it sounds like your teeth have been like a big thing for you for a yeah, long time. Mass massive yeah, yeah, when yeah. I was younger. Did you have bad teeth when you were younger? Yeah. Yeah. Up okay. until twenty two. Yeah, okay. The thing is no one would ever go, Oh, you got horrible teeth. Right. But they it just for me. Yeah, because you're in England, everyone's got shit teeth. Exactly. Yeah. Australians are big to point this out. <laughs> and um, I, uh, so I, I literally, this was when I was living in London, it's about two years ago, no book, no publicity, no press, nothing. And th I'm so glad I kind of, I saw a trend happening. I was like, this is something I'm probably going to want to sort out now. And all my friends told me not to do it. I went to Harley Street and I knew it was expensive there and there's no way I could afford it. But I was like, fuck it, this is important. And I sat down and uh, this dentist, Sahil Patel, the way he was young, and when he was speaking to me and talking to me about stuff, I was like, fuck, this guy knows what he's on about. Mm. It, w it wasn't like, you know, someone conning you in something. Yeah, yeah. And I said, what would you do? And he said, oh, I'm going to do this. And it's so mad. Even if I go to like a mechanics or I go to a dentist or I go to wherever, if I can tell in the early onset, even a waitress or waiter in the onset, if they can, almost in that first few minutes, if I can trust them, I'm like, do you know what? I'm going to have exactly what you tell me. Mm. And I love going to a restaurant, nothing more and saying, you know, someone's there, hey, and they're charismatic. I go, what shall I eat? They go, oh, this, this, this. And I'm like, do you know what? You're completely in charge of what we all eat tonight. Yeah, yeah. And I love doing that. I so love I, that. I, yeah. went, I went to his dentist and um, he did a draw examination. Yeah. And I was like, this is obviously buttering me up for the sale. Mm -hmm. And this draw examination, it was hard work. The stuff he was getting me to do and about- What do you mean hard work? The positions he made me hold, mm. positions like moving your draw laterally, things like that. Yeah. And afterwards he goes, I want to change your bite. And I was like, what? He's like, I want to change your bite. He goes, we can do this, we can do this, blah, 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 but I'm, I want to change where your bite is. I was like, cool. I was like, do you know what, mate? You're fully in charge, whatever you want to do. So he goes, sweet, this is how much it's going to cost. I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but Maybe I, you're not that in charge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I was like, do you know what? At this point, I'd already kind of, uh, he'd won my trust. I was like, let's do it. And um, I was like, I'll just, I'll, I'll pay for it with money that I should be paying tax and I can just, you know, pay that back over time. If I'm really late on tax, it's fine. And we did it. It's always a good strategy. And the first session was five and a half hours in a dentist chair. Fuck. That's pretty big. But at this point- No he, drugs. Uh, just local anesthetic. Local anesthetic. Which is fine. I put in a, I put in a podcast. No, I put in an audio book. And I started listening to The Chimp Paradox. Mm, and I good book. I couldn't stand the guy's voice. Oh, no. He doesn't say human. He says human. And about Is that, it the author that reads Chimp Paradox? No. I've read it. I haven't listened nah. to it. And about an hour in, I said, you got to stop what you're doing, mate, because I need to change this audio book. <laughs> <laughs> like, this guy's voice in my head. In. And um, he gets to the point of the whole point of the story. He changed my bite and it felt like my teeth were in the wrong place for about three weeks. Yeah. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night, close my mouth, and my teeth wouldn't align. Mm. And then since having that jaw realignment, my cheekbones have developed differently. Really? To where people now notice I look different. Not even when my mouth's closed, my jaw looks a bit different to how it was before. Mm. And I think that having my jaw put into a more optimal position has actually uh, allowed me to. I could be talking bullshit. This could be, be good looking for once. I think it's just go from a five to a six. It's just developed my jaw a little bit differently. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's. I'm so much happier with my my new jaw <laughs> alignment and and the teeth and everything like it. Um, but yeah, on the, on another every time I I. I go in there every time like a kid going to a, a school teacher. I was like, I oh, fucked him again. Mm. He goes, mate, it's supposed to last you 20 years. You come mm. back one year later with broken teeth. <laughs> what have you been doing? And I was like, oh, sorry, jiu-jitsu, mate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I'd never thought something as, as trivial as jaw position. Massive. Would have such an impact on... Massive. Teeth yeah. Teeth is huge. I never, I never appreciated it either. Like one of the things Pat says is what happens with kids is that they, if they mouth breathe for whatever reason, which is fine. Like maybe they get sick, their nose gets blocked up or some sinus issue happens, they mouth breathe for a bit. Because their kids are not aware or conscious of this, they keep their mouth open. So then they become mouth breathers. But your, your mouth, the structures in your mouth are not designed for breathing. They're designed for speaking and they're designed for eating and swallowing. So if they breathe with their mouth open, their tongue is not resting on the top of their, uh, in the, the roof of their mouth. And as a result, over the growth portions of their life be into adulthood if they've now trained mouth breathing and their tongue is not sitting flat in their roof most of the day 
then their jaw develops differently and what it, it develops narrower. And so as a result, they need braces. And so, because their teeth get all jammed, there's no room for them. And what's interesting is he knew this and he took this to the worldwide dental conference or whatever they have every year. He's got on stage and he spoke about it and blah, blah, blah. And some of the dentists pulled him aside and they said, Pat, we've known what you've said for a long time. He goes, oh, great. Well, let's fix it. Let's stop putting so many braces on so many kids and having so much messed up breathing and jaws. And they go, unfortunately not. He goes, we'll be out of, we'll be out of business. We'll make less money if we tell people about this stuff. So literally, there's almost a conspiracy within the dentist world that they don't want to actually fix kids breathing correctly and tell them to like, you know, tape their mouth shut and retrain nose breathing because then that means the thousands and millions of kids around the world won't need braces. And then all of a sudden, now dentists will make less money. There are um, some people, as soon as you say tape in the mouth, I think Eugene Tao. Yeah. And like, I, I've, I've, it's interesting. I got into my running a bit during lockdown and I don't know much about nasal versus mouth breathing apart from the fact that our nasal passage prepares air for the lungs. In, in essence I think it's a big thing to do with temperature and whatever else and I went for a 5k where I was going to do it all nasal breathing without my heart rate going above 150 mm -hmm. it's the most miserable run I've ever done oh it's hard it's horrible yeah it's hard you should they reckon you should be able to get 85% max capacity through your nose before you need to open your mouth that's the theory if you're like very well aerobically trained and you don't have any damages to your sinus or whatever but what you're talking about is yeah the nasal hairs obviously filter any like contaminants but the in the in your nasal cavity is nitric oxide and when you breathe in nitric oxide it helps to regulate your blood pressure so people that breathe through their mouth they don't breathe in any nitric oxide into their blood so as a result their blood pressure goes up so that's when they start to get cardiovascular issues and heart issues literally just because they're breathing through their mouth so you think about it your nose is blocked rogan talks about this right breathe through your mouth all day go to bed breathe through your mouth the whole time you're not getting any nitric oxide into blood, which is an essential ingredient for maintaining blood pressure. So people start getting all these hypertension issues, they get cardiovascular issues. It's just mouth breathing. That's all it is for a lot of people. Sleep apnea is a big issue. People with disrupted sleep. And I've been looking at my sleep. I'm actually quite looking forward to that whoop bang coming, which we'll talk about mm. in a second. Um, I get very long but light sleep. And last night I slept 11 hours, which was amazing. But even my Garmin still picks it up as a light sleep. Was it deep? Did it Not, feel deep? Uh, it, it felt it felt what I needed. I don't know. I can't really distinguish between the two, but I snore. Mm. And uh, I know that a lot of... I've been told it's very difficult when you talk about snoring, especially <laughs> when you're drunk, that people go, you stop breathing. They're mm. like, you, you snoring. And then people are like, is he alive? <laughs> and then, then it comes out. With the resting heart rate of 41, I, I there's probably long gaps between. But yeah, people uh, with disrupted sleep, people think if they go to bed and then they wake up again, that that's kind of it. But there are a lot of issues surrounding that. And some people that do have sleep apnea, they then wear a mask, don't they? That kind of forces air. Yeah, yeah. But yeah they, it's like a breathing device. It holds their, holds their jaw open. And then they wake up reportedly feeling like the best sleep they've ever had. Yeah. Well, the problem with sleep apnea is a lot of it comes because people are overweight. Mm. And so the weight in their neck... Are you fat shaming people? I'm definitely doing that right now. <laughs> the weight in their neck, it pushes the tongue it, or, or the, the muscles relax or whatever and the tongue doesn't hold its position and it falls back into the throat, blocks the airway. Um, but the issue is, what do you need to lose weight? You need a foundation of good sleep. 100%. So now it's kind of... You, you've put yourself in this really difficult situation where it's like, okay, I need you to lose weight so you can sleep more. But in order for you to lose weight, I need you to sleep more. So they've kind of got this roadblock, which is really hard to contend with. I don't have the perfect solution. I don't know. But I just sort of think to myself, look, really the weight just has to come off. So I'm just talking severe calorie deficit exercise. You're going to feel like shit. You know, you're going you're gonna to go on four or five hours of disrupted sleep at best. But we just need to take this weight off no matter what. I just, I can't work to get you to sleep more because you're too fat, you know? It's, uh, it's one of those things where I love taking it out of context where imagine someone's like, I've got this bill I need to pay. I've got to pay my credit card debt off. By the end of the month, I'm fucked. Mm. Cool, well, you're making jam sandwiches at home. Oh, but I like steak. Well, you fucked that right in the build-up to this by not managing your finances. And I know that some people are going to be like, oh, you're fat phobic and all of this, but it's it's exactly that. And when people, there is this almost like point of no return with obesity Definitely. where sleep is such a, a big hindering factor. And I... It's, it's, it's like the biggest productivity hack. And again, we'll probably talk about it in a bit. My stint of sobriety I've got coming up where I love just focusing on my sleep. Um, it's not a metric that I'd hold, like cherish, but sleep. 
rest and heart rate, VO2 max, all of these things. If I need, if you said, James, I really want you to improve these in your performance and all of this, I would have to set sleep as the main foundation. And I had an issue last week where my Definitely. diet went too clean and I wasn't getting enough salt in and mm. my low sodium. And I thought to myself, I haven't had much salt the last few days. And I Google <laughs> low sodium sleep and it's correlated with yeah. like dis disrupted sleep. And I was like, fuck, I've been, I've been neglecting my electrolytes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know who did that um, recently? Always, the story always stuck out with me was Aubrey Marcus, founder of On It. He went on this kick where he was drinking... Uh, what's the, is it distilled water where they take all the minerals out of it? Yeah. So he started drinking lots of distilled water because he obviously he's, he's a you know a sucker for pseudoscience. So he just obviously read some bullshit about distilled water. It draws all the nutrients out of you. Right. So as a result, he started getting this sleep disruptions and then he started getting this high-pitched noise that wouldn't, wasn't going away. He's like, what is that ringing noise? And everyone's like, there's no ringing noise. And he's like, there is a ringing noise. And so he's getting his ears checked. He's, he's like potentially looking at ear surgery. They're scanning his brain, all this sort of stuff. And then he gets a blood test and they're like, you have no electrolytes in your system. You drank the electrolytes, slept the next day and all his, all his hearing issues went away. Yeah, distilled water. Your body always wants a state of homeostasis, doesn't it? Yeah. So when you consume water that's void of any sodium, phosphate, whatever kind of stuff that you see in tap water, calcium, whatever, calcium, yeah. it'll draw it out. And uh, yeah, those things, it's such a multifaceted approach to, the thing is you don't want to over complexify <laughs> elements of nutrition, but then as soon as you get there with someone, it is a journey. And I mean, when you teach someone to learn to drive, you're like, right, clutch, brake, accelerator, gears. Then you bring in, you're like, well, there's an indicator here. Oh, we need to check. Yeah, yeah. Out. And although it's like, People are like, oh, you just care about calories in, calories out. You're like, nah, that, that's the first stage we need to get to. Yeah. Once you get beyond that, then it's all kind of smooth sailing from there. Because if you can say to someone, look, this is $12 a month, but it's going to help you sleep, sweet, cool. It's almost like little add-ons. Yeah. Like In-app purchases. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. In their life. Uh, <laughs> Microtransactions. Yeah. And uh, interestingly enough, I, I did put this in the show notes. You converted me this week to order a Whoop band. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's like a... Sta like a just to go back quickly on what you were saying, I think what happens is you go from this state of like ill health, not caring into this state of like, okay, I've lost a bit of weight. I'm feeling good or whatever. And then you move into this state, which is like optimization mm. where you enter this world where you're at the tip of the mountain. There's a few people standing around and they're like, we're here to get the 1% of the 1%. And as soon as you start getting that level of optimization, you feel fucking good mm. and you don't want to lose that. So you do everything. You buy eighteen hundred dollar sleep blanket. You know you, you buy like world class air conditioning. You buy mushroom supplements. You buy all these things because now you start to see yourself edging ahead of the game. You know some people feel good and they feel great and they go to the gym, but they still booze a lot on the weekends. They still have fifty fifty good meals, bad meals, but generally they're pretty healthy, right? The doctor's not upset with them, but once you're in a state of optimization, like you don't want to go back from that. Last two years, I've I've not slept without an aircon unit in Australia. And uh, I, I actually moan. What temperature is that on? Lowest. All the time. 16. <laughs> uh, it goes to about 17, 18. That's cold. Yeah. And I, I always have it on full blast because I love sleeping cold. I've always wrapped myself up in a blanket. I've always slept with stuff between my legs. I actually don't like even having a foot out. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up with monsters Not even around my bed. <laughs> actually, we had cats when I grew up and the cats would go for your feet in the middle of the night. Yeah. Uh, don't have cats anymore. And... Um, yeah, just because of that, I, I love being wrapped up and the boys come in sometimes. They go, it's fucking freezing in here. And then um, I'm there in a, in a pregnancy face. pillow. You got a face mask up. on? Yeah, I've got a face mask on. <laughs> so you've got your nose and your moustache just, just poking out. out. <laughs> yeah, and then I've got that. And, and that's just how I like to sleep. I love being cocooned. And I love waking up and not knowing what time it is and not caring. Mm. Because when I wake up and I can see light, I then start thinking, oh, it's time to get up. You see it through the face mask? Nah. Oh, okay. So, like, uh, if I don't wear a face mask, okay. Any, no, it's almost made me more that light awakening response, uh, cortisol light awakening response, I think they call it, um, <laughs> is is proper in intense. So the eye mask is amazing, but yeah, I I sleep super cold, and when there's a, like a heat wave, oh, it's so hot, so hot. I'm like, I told you, boys, to my neck. Yeah. Mine was a thousand dollars, right? Which is is not a lot, but you're talking f months of better quality sleep. Ah. Oh. Even just your day is feeling better, more even awake. Even if you're going out for dinner and yeah. you want to have a, a cool environment to get dressed in. And I said to the boys, we, we joke around, this is a really poor metric. In Australia, bags of cocaine are really expensive. Very. About $300, about £150 a bag. And uh, not endorsing it, not condoning it by any means, but as banter over the years, a lot of the time we compare things to how many bags it would be. 
So if someone's like, oh, fucking hell, I've been caught speeding, that's $300. I'm like, that's a bag, mate. <laughs> and um, with the aircon, uh, someone was like, how much was that? I was like, it's about $900. I said, like, yeah, fuck, it's quite a lot. I went, fuck off. It's three, it's three bags, you dickhead. So, you know, you go to the pub, you go Surrey Hills for a night, then you've got the festival you were going to go to and one other thing. If you just go bagless for that, you've got aircon mm. for years. And years. When you can get into someone's mind with that, uh, by the way, I'm using the the kind of... The, the cocaine parallels <laughs> so that I can stop people from doing it so they can spend their it's money. It's making it relatable, places. man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, because no, that makes sense. Yeah, because it, and then people go, fuck, you know, if I knocked it on the head for three weeks, I could have air con for the next two years. And those things are so important to, like you say, the optimization process. And it kind of annoys me where even people skimp on beds and mattresses and it, it's such an integral part of your life. Huge. Yeah, I mean, mattresses, what you sleep... They reckon you need to change a mattress once every seven years at the latest. I think most people listening to this have not changed their mattress in the last seven years. No even, way. Even a good pillow setup. When I, I noticeably sleep worse when I haven't got the pillow setup I want. And, you know, people in a world where we, we spend so much money on so many things... I said this as well. When you fly business class with Etihad, it'll cost you about £4,000 return. It's about $8,000 you get the shittest little pillow and people aren't taking their own pillows. And I thought this was mad. So I'm obviously very uh, privileged to be able to fly business years of late. And for the record, I didn't ever fly business class 27. And, you know, my mom and dad never... Why'd you point at me like that? Because you're 27. <laughs> 28. 28. Uh, and so it was a very late stage in my life. Uh, no one ever put me into a business class seat. And it was a weird thing for me. But when I got there, I was like, this is amazing. I can lay flat. Wow, I've got champagne. I've got food coming. But I was like, what is this? If I was staying in a five-star hotel and only had that little pillow, mm. I would be kicking off, right? And it seems to me that airlines have skimped on the pillow front. Mm. Even in first class, you only get one pillow. And I'm like, yeah, you've got a lay flat bed. You give me a fucking shower on a plane. You're letting me shower on a plane. I've got my own chef, but I've got shit pillows. And to me, that I now fly with a pillow. And you know what? Air stewardess like, what's that? I'm like, what's the pregnancy pillow? <laughs> Why have you got that? Oh, you put a pregnancy pillow on yeah, to the, an airplane. Yeah, not the curved one, just the long tubular one. So well, I can side normal. sleep and get my leg over it. And the air hostesses usually laugh. But I'm like, look, even if I was to buy that pillow for about $60, 30 quid, and leave it on the plane, that as a percentage of the flight cost is nothing, negligible. Yeah. It's like maybe 1%. Yeah. So, yeah. so like, so everyone's there spending all this money. I look around, I'm like, you lot are mental for not bringing your own pillows. <laughs> Even travel pillows, right, is better than no pillow. But no yeah. one in business is carrying a travel pillow. It doesn't fit in their Louis Vuitton bag. <laughs> but again, it's just this little 1% that people are kind of missing. I'm like, you've gone so far, then you stopped. Yeah. Well, the caveat to that is that I actually am the only person I know that sleeps without a pillow and have for my whole life. Fuck off. Yeah. Never had a pillow. Fuck off. No, nah, never had a pillow. I don't know why. What it is, I have this weird thing where I'm like, the spine is supposed to be straight, right? This, Top, this is my theory right. as a kid. Like the spine is supposed to be straight. If someone, if you were standing up all day and someone was pressing against the back of your head and pushing you forward, it'd be fucking uncomfortable. You'd have a shit posture. Are you a back sleeper? So, yeah. So, I've always just slept on my back perfectly straight because I wanted a straight back and I just got used to it. But the advantage is, like you're saying, the worst thing is when you're not at home and you don't have your pillow, you're on an airplane, you're in a hotel, you're in an Airbnb and you've got this shit pillow and it's just pissing you off and you don't sleep for the whole trip. It doesn't matter to me. I don't need a pillow. You've uh, life hacked it. <laughs> you've, see, you've seen this happening for years. And then you're, you're an 11 year old child and you go, there's no pillows on business. So don't I'm, need a pillow. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big advocate of pillows because I'm a side sleeper. Yeah, that's fair. So, you couldn't do it. You can't do it on your side. A pregnancy pillow to me keeps my spine straight and also stops my hips from twisting. Which do you is ever why get I'm, neck issues when you wake up? Sometimes? Uh, no, mostly okay. from getting, not tapping to guilty. <laughs> <laughs> like I couldn't train last night. My neck's still pretty fucked from yeah. that. Um, I've never had a neck issue. Ever from sleep? Not from sleep, uh, from jujitsu. Yeah, I yeah. actually had to uh, Friday night and Saturday morning. I had to hold my head to get it off the pillow. I had to grab my head yeah, physically. Yeah, yeah. I sprained my neck. When I used to do strict handstand push-ups in CrossFit back when I was just one of those guys, lots of neck issues, lots of compression issues. Is Kip, kipping handstand push-ups. You know the ones I'm talking about. Yeah. Can you do them? Uh, I can do handstand push-ups. Yeah. yeah. Not many. They're bad for your neck. I. Awful. Yeah, because you just compress all the weight and kick. It's, uh, Don't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, it's an interesting one because, like, like you're saying, everyone's got this like individual kind of sleep setup and and everything else, but it is something that's neglected. Oh yeah, like yeah. The, the amount of girls that have got a Gucci belt and a fucking shit house pillow, and like I'm like wrong place to invest your money. 
Yeah, well, it just depends what's important to them, right? It's just people's values. That's all it is. It's like, you know, we're starting this new gym locker room. I'm sure we'll get to it. But, you know, we're asking people for a significant investment. But for some people, the investment you're asking for, because health and fitness and networking is so high up their value chain, it's nothing. And as a percentage of their income for this clientele, it's also nothing. But even if the percentage of the income relative to each client at the gym is the same, say it's half a percent of their income, depending on where it sits in your values, it may be expensive or it may not be expensive, which I've always found is interesting because you always go, what do you mean? You can afford that. You make a million dollars a year. They go, yeah, but mate, 60 bucks for a gym. I can get it for 25 bucks if I go to fitness first. You're like, bro, what are you talking about? It's your health. You know what I mean? So, but it just depends where it sits on your value chain. If partying and doing bags sits high on your value chain, you know, $300 for a bag is nothing. Yeah, it's, it's mad that you say that. Yeah. People go, oh, you know, and it's become like an associative cost. Yeah which is ridiculous. Uh, and, you know, again, it's, it's one of these things with fitness trackers where you say to someone, you're like, yeah, this is an $800 Garmin, but the repercussions of it are you're probably going to do more steps, probably going to focus on your sleep, probably going to go to bed earlier. And you, I feel like now more than ever, we're selling optimization to people. Yes. And we're almost like the accountability middle ground. Mm. And it's an interesting era because uh, there is going to be a trend of technology. The, I can already see it now. Technology, fitness, optimization, wellness all of this they're going to be integrated more than ever you can see by apple trying to bring out their own kind of fitness they've got the home workouts now yeah the home workouts app the thing about that is when they stepped into the market so peloton you know peloton so for those listening who don't know what peloton is basically it's a billion dollar public company that grew absurdly fast overnight it's an at-home bike workout so you've got like a really big lcd screen on a spin bike and you connect into it and you do live workouts and all this sort of stuff. It's interactive live community. They've got Peloton gyms. They've got a treadmill now with dumbbells. So it's all this, it's expanded crazy. But Peloton instructors are so, they're so good at what they do. And because you don't need many of them, right? Because what you need 10, they do all the workouts. You know, one person, a million people can do the workout. They're so highly sought after. They're in such high demand for really quality instructors. Because basically the quality of the instructor is the quality of the workout, right? Because there's so few factors involved in a workout that they're getting paid Currently, because Apple stepped into the market and they tried to buy Peloton instructors, their price went up so high. They're getting paid two hundred fifty to five hundred dollars per session. It's not even an hour session. They're doing ten to fifteen sessions a week. You do the math: two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars US a year. These people are making. They're doing ten sessions a week. That's nothing. You do five sessions. You do two sessions in the morning. You know, you do the six a.m. You do the seven a.m. You've got your workout in. You go lie on the beach all day. You're making quarter million dollars, half a million dollars a year. It's fucking crazy. It's mad the way that technology has now enabled people to do this. And I mean, when I was personal training on the floor, my earning capacity, there, there was always a ceiling, but it was a happy ceiling, you know. Um, what do you mean happy ceiling? Like it was it was enough. I right. mean, as a personal trainer in the UK, first year you think, oh, you can only earn this, you can only earn that. But when you understand commoditization, how to run a business, I still think it's a very good deal that uh, I was going to work and finishing at 2 p.m. And I was still making probably best part of 50 to 70 K sterling a year, which is like 140 Aussie dollars K a year. And I think that if people can create their own balance, that's fine. But then technology did step in to allow people like Peloton instructors, app owners, all of this stuff to do it because the offerings are just changing in the market. Yeah. And it it's good. And I mean, like Duran, for instance, with his knee up 24 seven, which is quite a cool movement towards people increasing their need. Something that no one else was really doing in the market. Everyone's selling workouts and he's mm -hmm. like, you know, let's let's do things from a different angle. And I see fitness trackers becoming more and more popular. You use an iWatch, which I, do, do you know what? I'm an Apple man through and through. But I just don't like them. Mm -hmm. Well, I use the Whoop and the, to, to come back to the Whoop, the Whoop is, um, the Whoop was started in the, uh, I think it started in golf. I know Michael Phelps, LeBron James, and Tiger Woods were their early ambassadors when he first cracked the market. So Will, the founder, um, he came on our show. We interviewed him, and he talked about how he was Harvard. He was a Harvard alumni, and then he wanted to create fitness uh, tracker, which basically told him why some days he rocked up to training feeling good, but he performed like shit, and why other days he felt like shit coming to the gym, but he performed really well. He wanted to understand his body better, so he used HRV technology, which is in the Garmin which is in the Apple Watch, but the Whoop's taking 10,000 more data points per second than either of these devices. Do you get kickback on your promo code? No, no. Does uh, it benefit you in any way? We get uh, you in the well, good it, just, it just shows we, that it shows them that we're getting them results still. 
All right, what yeah. I'll do is uh, I'll put your promo code in my show notes. All right, we can do that. Yeah, because I, but, but before anyone jumps into it, I haven't used it yet. If it's good, if it helps me, which I think it will because it's helping my friends, put your promo code in. Then Will can message you and be like, Lucky, you're the fucking man. You're the fucking That'll man. That'll be you because their contract's expiring soon. So maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe this is good timing. Um, but no, the reason I liked it was because HRV or statistics and data, the, the thing that really got me on them, because um, we're looking at a few different fitness technologies to partner with, was it's 24 7. That's what I like about it because the problem with heart rate and some of this other stuff is you have to actually find a designated time to take your HIV, to lie down, put the heart rate strap on, wet the sensors, lie there, breathe for five minutes. I'm like, I, I don't have fucking have time for that shit. No one has time for that Well, you just don't want to do it. Yeah. So if you just got something on and you just forget about it and it's just tracking all the data nonstop, all you have to do is remember to charge it every five days. You don't have to open the app. You don't have to have your phone on you. You just have to keep this thing on your body. And, and the charger connects to the strap and then you take it off. Yeah, and you just clip it on. It's like external battery pack. So, But the reason I like it is because less so for myself. I think it's always good to take more data and to, you know, because what you... For English listeners, he means data. <laughs> so what you measure, you manage, right? But what I've found is really good as a retention tool, and I think, I, was, I think we spoke about this, but you should definitely have something for the academy to get it because as a retention tool for clients, it's been the best thing. I have spent the last five years researching psychology, change behavior, all this sort of stuff to get people more invested and more committed. The questions asked them, the language we talk about in our sessions to get them to just show up to the gym. All I have to do is, now they have to spend 25 bucks a week, they show up to the gym more often because they're in the red or in the, they're in the green or they're tracking their sleep. I even had a client, he had a million dollar deal in one of his um, businesses. So this client was worth a million dollars to him essentially. And uh, he was sitting across from the guy in the city uh, end of last year and the guy was like Steve stop what you're saying he goes I've spoken to seven recruiters today and I'll give you the work he goes you want to know why I gave you the work he goes because oh, you like me he goes no because you're wearing a whoop he goes the whoop has not only changed my life but it made me a million dollars pretty incredible so people that see the whoops on other people they're like you're taking your health and fitness seriously we'll probably get along Garmin's have a similar effect uh, because a friend of mine who actually got me into wearing it. He goes, they're going to business meetings in IT companies. And they're like, oh, four, four runner, three, five, seven. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, is that a Strava, is that Strava jargon? No, 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 that's like one of the models. Oh, okay. So they're like, what are you, a uh, runner, buy, try? <laughs> I'm an Iron Man. Oh, let's get to business. And like, uh, um, it's, it's, a, funny it's a funny one because I, feel, I think triathletes are interesting people. They're, they're, they're a breed apart from other athletes. Oh, yeah. Usually a little bit weird, but, uh, yeah, so much head time. The, well, you've the, had Ross Edgley on. We've had Ross Edgley as well. You almost, he doesn't fit the profile. Yeah, he's, he's like a normal guy. Yeah, doesn't make sense. I'm like, how did you spend six months with your face down in the ocean? I'd love to be a therapist. Oh. <laughs> I think he just breaks down and cries <laughs> about how he's tortured for being short as a kid. Yeah, he'll be like, he'll probably say something like, I was in year two. It was a snowy day. It was twelve, <laughs> And then he'll be like, someone said I had small arms. <laughs> Ever Someone since. says I wasn't that fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but the thing about Garmin's is I often call them the puss repellents. Oh, absolute yeah. puss repellent. This Disgusting. Is, this is the absolute sex appeal killer. Um, that's why. That's what I sold you on the Whoop. I go, you can rock the Rolex and the Whoop at the same time. And you're like, oh yeah, what's the code again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, and again, uh, I've got to take this off for jujitsu, and I'm really excited about the prospect of tracking uh what i'm doing with the with a whoop strap on my bicep during jiu-jitsu classes yeah. because it actually killed me off when i when covid uh lockdown eased off and i got back into jiu-jitsu i was like my most intense training is happening on the mats and it's the only time i can't track my intensity so i was like oh fuck this garmin it's not giving me a fair reading mm. um my hrv struggles to keep up with what i'm doing uh off the mats and again for listeners uh heart rate variability is uh, an interesting way of determining uh, whether you're dominant parasympathetic or sympathetic, which is part of CNS, CNS? Yeah, yeah. And parasympathetic, think para, parachute, slowing down, rest and digest. Sympathetic, fight or flight. And they seem like very dramatized classifications, but in essence, one's adrenal dominant and one's kind of recovering dominant. Yeah. And we need to have certain peaks and troughs through each throughout the day for balance. And because of emails, alerts, notifications, sh stresses, you know, all of these things that we live in, people are being too dominant in their adrenal pathways, 
which isn't giving them the balance they need. And like you say, subjectively, some people may rock up to the gym going, I feel amazing. Mm. But then their heart rate will say, actually, you've not recovered enough. And then it, it's good to give yourself the peace of mind. Like last night, I actually FaceTimed Lucy Lord because I was like, Lord, I'm not going training. I'm being a dickhead. She was like, well, if you're tired, you're tired. Mm. And my HRV was giving me the indication that I probably shouldn't go training. Yeah. Because I'd go along. I was like, guys, I'm just going to do technique. But the second they go, put your gum shields in, I'll be like, let's go. <laughs> of course. And, um, of course. And then I slept 11 hours off the back of it. And the only thing I do find is that you stress about your stress. And yeah. You stress about your recovery. And sometimes in the middle of the night, I'll wake up and I'll go, fuck, this is going to look so shit on my sleep. Mm. Yeah, you know what? That's that's probably the one thing that I would say is hard about Whoop is it because now you want to optimize all the time is that, yeah, I have friends that are on the Whoop and they're checking their sleep midway through the night. How am I sleeping? What sleep cycles am I in? I'm like, that's not how sleep works, bro. Check it at the end. So sometimes I just have to say, hey, look, park the phone out of the room. Just let the data take the data. And I think it kind of wears off after a little while. You get excited in the beginning, but then you find a nice balance with how to use it. But I think what... What I always think about when I'm integrating technology into my life because you got to think about the cost of your time as well when you're using this thing. But I also think about, will this make a genuine change in my behavior? Because that's ultimately what you want, right? You want a positive change in your behavior. And what I like about this is they have community groups. So you can make your own little leaderboards. So you can compete on recovery, on sleep, on strain, which is their version of how hard you've worked for the day. But what I like about it is the accountability is there. If someone gets in the leaderboard, and they've had four hours sleep, you know for sure that day you are copying shit in the WhatsApp group for four hours sleep. If, you've, if you're if you on 1% recovery, everyone wants to know about the bender you had. How many bags did you have last <laughs> night? How many drinks did you have? Why are you on 1%? Don't bullshit me. What's activity at 3 a.m. to 4 a.m.? Like, what were you doing there? You know, so there's that accountability. Some boys opt out. They take the whip strap off. They go, the boys are going to give me shit if they know I'm partying on a Wednesday night. I'm so quite, I'm going to put the wind. I'm quite outside. excited about wearing a fitness tracker I can have sex in. That's why <laughs> if I put that on my ankle. It does. It does. It does register sex. Because there's no way I can have sex with a Garmin. You know, like they're, they're, you just can't do that. Yeah, well, it's going to get in the way. Yeah, not. It's going to yeah, hurt someone. Yeah, not only that. That thing is massive. Yeah, it is. It massive. Is, it's just going to be. And you've got a big wrist as well. So uh, like on a girl, that's a, that's a no-go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, you take a kit off, she's going, oh, I'm not in the mood. Why is that? <laughs> Four runner, three, five, seven, or whatever it is. But, but um, la- yeah, la- last thing on the on this, uh, what I like about it is there's a journal function, and the journal function basically you write your own questions. So it's just a, a left note, swipe left, swipe right. So it might be like, did I drink magnesium last night? Yes. Did I have sex last night? Yes. Did I share my bed? No. All those sorts of things, right? All these different questions. So then it's pulling the data together, and then it starts giving you things. It goes, hey, when you report magnesium, you sleep sixteen percent deeper. So Luke said about this, Luke Howard, MMA, uh, our mate, he said that he gets 9% better recovery when he drinks magnesium, yep. which I thought was fucking mad. And also he gets better recovery when he sleeps in bed with his girlfriend. Mm. And I was like, I was like, these are insights I need. <laughs> yeah. Why is my Garmin not doing this? Yeah, Why is yeah. this not enough? Yeah. So one of the ones I had, which was interesting is, um, well, I saw myself under the bus here, but yeah, when you, when you use marijuana, I get 12% better recovery the next day, which is interesting. The weeds. Yeah, and that that's actually, I'm going to just hijack this this moment right now, but one thing that I think I've always appreciated about your content is you're open to speaking about drug use, which is always, I think, a good thing. I think the more transparency you have, the better. And the way I've always seen drugs, it's the same way if you and I both have a friend called, you've got a friend and you're like, I'm sure called Michael, right? You know a Michael. I know a Michael. Depending on what that Michael is like, he either might be a dickhead, and the, and when I say Michael, you think of that guy straight away, and you go, oh, I fucking hate that guy. He's uh, not like shit. Yeah. But a, the Michael might be a boss that I know. I go, oh, fucking love Mike. He's a ledge. That's the same with drugs. So like like there's lots lots of different Michaels, but it's the one word. There's lots of different drugs, and depending on your early experiences with the word drug, determines how your programming is the rest of your life. And I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people's early programming with the word drug is very negative and they can't unprogram themselves. They don't have the awareness for that. Oh, I don't do drugs. I'm like, okay, well, how is this thing that's classified a drug legal on a different patch of fucking dirt across an ocean that's actually helping people, that's lowering anxiety, that's curing cancer, that's helping epilepsy, that is, of course, there's, you know, the damage is in the dose, but if it's getting 12% better recovery and I manage it and it helps me unwind and de-stress and be less anxious... Who's to how, say otherwise? How is that a bad thing? 
it's it's right. It's a fucking good conversation. I mean, like um, marijuana for me is something that I I personally just don't like it. But I never say to people, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. Mm. And you know, I, I probably two years of my life when I was younger, that I used to do it a lot. And even now, I'm I'm not really mad on it. And it's crazy. I used to think it made me unproductive, but it wasn't. I was just chilling out. Mm. And I was actually I've appreciated in my earlier years doing way too much. When I got stoned, I got catastrophically. <laughs> Fucking, I, I was. King, hey, Brown is deep in a bong. Yeah, King Bong, <laughs> man. And, and I realized that king I was. Bong. It was all in the dose. And yeah. a friend of mine uh, made me some weed brownies, and I did one. I was fucked. So then I tried taking a quarter and going for a walk, and I could barely feel I was stoned. Mm. And it was brilliant. Mm. And I used my phone less. I appreciated the walk a bit more. Even feeling wind in my face on a quarter brownie, I was like, "This is so good." <laughs> Uh, but it's just something that at this stage of my life I'm not mad into. But yeah, you're you're completely right. And I think I've got some friends that are very heavily wound and they're like very intense, very intense. And when they smoke weed, they, they get to relax and mm. they actually can't physically relax otherwise. And like you say, uh, I was watching a Louis Thoreau documentary yesterday and he goes, today I'm going to be talking to people about Britain's favorite drug, alcohol. And I was like, fuck, I never thought of it mm. as Britain's favorite drug. Mm. And when you look at alcohol, I've spoken about this, you... Bad decisions, memory loss, uh, you know, fucking poor. It's not good for your health. Not unprotected good for your sex. Yeah, unprotected <laughs> sex. Fucking, I'd love to know how many pregnancies in the UK are alcohol <laughs> related. Someone's had three cans of fucking special K. And they're fucking <laughs> knocking up the neighbor in the council flat. And um, it, it's just one of those ones where, you know, everyone's, oh, you know, the war on drugs, the war on drugs, this and that. But alcohol is really bad. Cigarettes are, are fucking awful. You're omnipresent for everyone. And what's annoying about cigarettes as well? From, take everything apart why are people allowed to flick cigarette butts on the floor I don't think they are but they're not but they, they society doesn't yeah you know, they're you, like whatever you sneeze in public now you might as well just shit your pants in the middle oh, of yeah. the high street yeah. someone flicks a cigarette butt no one blinks mm. and like one day I would love to commission big scary men with baseball bats and the second someone flicks a cigarette butt on the floor ten of them just approach them <laughs> so you know when they smash the bat into their hand I pick that up yeah. you little cunt with all those things, right? Yeah. With any any bit it, of rubbish. It, yeah. Just pick that up, put it in the bin. Yeah. There are no bins about. <laughs> Eat it. <laughs> Smoke the butt. <laughs> yeah. Finish the whole thing. There are so many things that you do that are bad for your health. You know. Uh, again, vaping is another one as well. Yeah. And so yeah, we, and there's not really. I don't know too much about the science on vaping, but if you think about obesity, is is almost now becoming protected. Mm. And this isn't fat Protected shaming. species. Yeah. Yeah. Man, you know, that's fat shaming. PC. Yeah. You know, that's fat shaming. That's fat phobic. That's that. And the worst thing is there are doctors now who are, uh, anti, you know, talking about fat phobia and fat shaming. And they're doing exactly what Sam Harris spoke about yesterday. What did he call it? I actually put a um, uh, audience capture mm. where a lot of people now in a bid to tell their audience what they want to hear. And the anti-diet, the, uh, you know, the, these people... They need to be activists within a certain space to get engagement. One for ads and two to stay relevant. And they're now telling people what they want to hear. And, you know, I can't help but think that a lot of this anti-diet, a lot of this, uh, you know, body positivity movement is audience capture. People so worried in a time where, you know, if you say, you know, being obese is unhealthy, objectively, you could lose obese followers because mm. you're telling them what they don't want to hear. Yeah. And it's, it's such a shame that people are now just explaining a narrative you know, even there are a lot of evidence-based practitioners who are not talking about the vaccine because they don't want to lose followers. Yeah. We've had one of the biggest miraculous breakthroughs in scientific history and people are against it. And like, you know, it's it's crazy that we, we say now that like, drugs are bad, but there's no authoritative figures telling people that why they should be pro-vaccinated, which would reduce the amount of deaths in the UK. There are not enough authoritative voices about reducing obesity, which is another big complicator of COVID and cardiovascular disease, heart attacks. Yeah, type forget about diabetes. COVID. Yeah, all kind of, <laughs> there's enough issues before COVID. Cigarettes, well, you can't see them, but you still buy them. Mm. Alcohol. If you just stop in the high street and look around at how many places you can get alcohol from, why is it that you can't get stoned? Why is it that you can't smoke weed? Why is it you can't take LSD or do a sensible dose of magic mushrooms? Why is it that in Amsterdam, where you are allowed to take five pills into a nightclub, as long as you let the bouncer look at them, that's fine. And I would love to see the data on deaths in places where responsible drug use. Mm. And again, the the biggest thing for me is it's all in the dose. Mm. Uh, I know that ketamine gets a bad name. 
And loads of people ask the worst thing ever, oh, okay, okay, oh, okay, oh, you did too much. It's five times more potent than cocaine. So if you take a untrained <laughs> cocaine avid user and rail up a line of ketamine, you're in, you're, you're anesthetized. Yeah. You're quite literally <laughs> anesthetized. You are in the hole. But ketamine now uh, being uh, used for PTSD treatment, antidepressant. That's right. Yeah, I forgot about that. And it's and again, a lot of these things are all in the dose. LSD, posit- I think it was like 10 out of 14 participants, most meaningful experience of their life. And we're all yeah, and in. reported that 10 years later after that experience as well. And But we're just shoving these under the carpet as, you know, like you say, that Michael Michael anecdote is really exactly what it is. And, you know, just fucking, we could say the same about anal. You could have had, you could have first time you done anal, had a girl shit herself. That can really upset oh, yeah. your, your opinion on anal. So you hear, you hear anal. <laughs> you're like, and you think smelly shit, <laughs> disaster. Someone says anal, you're like, oh. <laughs> but to you someone else, that. someone else, he's like, it's the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> it's the best night of my life. And uh, these subjectivities, you know, if people are allowed to use sex toys and peg each other behind closed doors, <laughs> then why can't someone smoke a bit of THC? Yeah, well, I think it's I think it's a shame that all that stuff is, like you said, so open and re- readily available, but the other stuff is shunned. And that book I'm trying to get you to read, How to Change Your Mind, he talks about the, it's not really the conspiracy, it's just the history of psychedelic use and how it got the bad rap that it got. Because traditionally with these medicines because they're so strong is that they were uh, the the way that they were introduced to someone was through an elder so these are traditional tribes and that was the tradition of using because they're so powerful it's like hey we'll have these ceremonies and a lot of them were like uh, like uh, maturing ceremonies so when you know you go from you know teenagehood to adulthood so you'd have those would be your first introductions to these drugs so they're very sacred they belonged in ceremonies. They were very traditional. You know, your dad or your grandfather would teach you about it and you would learn about it and you'd go along with music and dance and all this sort of stuff. So it had its it had its proper place because thousands and thousands of years of practice and ritual had indoctrinated these medicines into the communities. Now, take the Americans, the North Americans. Of course, they get a hold of these things and they go, cool, let's just fucking eat them. But that made the elders freak out because now you're going in the reverse order. You've got the youth taking these substances that the adults don't understand or that the wise people don't understand and that freaked them out. So that as a result, they started to put all these laws and all these bans in. So one of the things that they were concerned about was, and they go into this in the book in more detail, but just quick overview, the head of publishing, I want to say of the New York Times, it might have been another magazine, but it was to that level, maybe like the Washington Post or something. His wife suffered from severe alcoholism in, uh, I think it was in 1950 or late 1950s, maybe the 60s, and nothing was working. AA, all the traditional treatments, the electrode treatments, all this different stuff, it wasn't working. He was concerned he was going to lose her. So this new treatment that had just come along, they just synthesized LSD. So they used LSD treatment to get her off alcohol. Worked straight away. Got her off alcohol, right? Miracle cure. He goes, fuck, this is crazy. Everyone has to know about it. It saved my life's wife, like only a positive thing, right? So he writes up this massive article, takes it to the editors and the um, American government gets a hold of this article before it goes out and they say, you can't release this. It's bad. It's bad for the public. He goes, no, no, what are you talking about? No, this has just happened with my wife. It's like a new uh, treatment. I think we found a cure for addictive diseases potentially. They go, no, 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 we don't trust it. It's going to be bad. It could be unsafe because what was happening is tobacco companies and alcohol companies realized that they had enemy number one. They had something that was going to cure people from being addicted to them essentially getting their bills paid, them making money, which is more alcohol and tobacco sales. So as a result, they go, you can't publish it. Publish this instead. So literally, they did a swap. They forced him to publish this article, which was like, you know, LSD makes you go blind. It makes people jump off buildings and kill themselves. And but what about the girl skin. going off the building? She did that eight months after taking LSD. Yeah. And she was already depressive. Uh, she was, but I think she was a massive depressive person who was literally on suicide watch, took LSD, jumped out of wood and com- committed suicide eight months later. Oh, it was the LSD. And that's, that's in a world where how many, how many pieces of content can you consume a day? One newspaper and one TV channel? So it's like if 50% of your content coming in is telling you that it's bad and the other percent is not saying anything, 100% of your worldview of this drug is it's negative. It's mad that uh, I was talking with someone offline about uh, LSD and he was like, mate, that's, that's class A in the UK. You need to be careful because that's the highest... Is it class A? Class A, highest classification. So you got the mass, the biggest penalization for it. And I was like, 
people take this in like the 70s, the 80s, throughout. Like you talk to most people's parents and even celebrities. There's a program on Netflix about celebrities taking yeah, it. Yeah. What was it called? Kind of psychedelic, my Psychedelic Adventure or something. Yeah. yeah. And even like Sting, a well-respected yeah. musician. You go, oh, fucking hell, best, best day of my life, whatever. Yeah. And like you've got people taking meaningful experiences and sitting in parks, going into nature. And of course, when people use this, they shouldn't be driving, they shouldn't be using vehicles, whatever. That, class A. But then someone goes down the pub, has 12 pints, wakes up in a bush, pissed themselves and shit themselves. Yeah, that's fine. Mm. It's all right. It's Doesn't make sense. But the thing in our pocket right now, and likely the device that's connecting to some invisible wavelength and programming our voice into your head right now, do you know how that got invented? Steve Jobs directly credited his LSD experiences with the invention of the iPod and the iPhone. Directly credited it. I didn't know. Yeah. So he was very open about his use with it. He's like, it helps me to understand humans better. It helps me to understand where technology is going. I think people are just scared. That's what it is. It's just when I have conversations with people that aren't willing to try these medicines, despite them knowing, their thinking brain knowing that it is a, like, it is a medicine, it is safe in the right context, it is a good thing. It's just fear. It's just fear of the unknown. I think a lot of people as well uh, that may no need may know that they need therapy still don't get therapy. Sometimes people don't want answers. Well, worst enemy. Yeah, like, uh, and it's crazy because you know it, it's not to say this medicinal or you know well it is kind of in a, in its own sense, but some people just don't want help. Yeah, and I think we can see that with mental health. We can see that with obesity, and I think it's stigmatism, and stigmatism is socially driven through societies where you know as people are you know therapy or must be a bit mental or oh, you know when people yeah. do that oh, <laughs> know, mental <laughs> uh, and it, it's annoying it is annoying obviously there are some substances which obviously you would never advocate mm. someone said to me um there <laughs> we should keep illegal drugs you wouldn't recommend to your friends that's probably a good idea. <laughs> so like it's probably no, a good way of putting it. No one out there is going, mate, you need to try heroin. <laughs> but again, Oxycontin, fucking, uh, the amount of... Uh, uh, yeah, saw, they're addicted to it. Yeah, I saw, uh, I think it was on Nat Geo. Uh, I, I always watch Drugs Inc. Yeah. Uh, I used to actually save them, download them and watch them when I was backpacking in Asia. And, it's uh, on Netflix now, I think, Drugs Inc. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's fucking wild. And there yeah. was one guy who was like, uh, uh, talking about crack cocaine. He goes, I was rich, I had a boat, I had a wife, I had kids. I had the choice of that or crack. And I chose crack. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then uh, this other guy was talking about heroin. And he goes, uh, you can shoot it up, boil it in the spoon, inject it into your veins, or you can get the pills from over the counter. He's like, the pills are better. Mm. And, you know, there are some things out there and, and so many people that get addicted, back injuries. It, it's, it's almost like a knee-jerk reaction yeah. for practitioners. To Shoulder anti- surgeries, whatever. Antidepressants and heroin. And again, people go, oh, don't do LSD in a park with your mate. But, here you go. Here's mm. some oxycotton. Mm. Here's a cocodamol. Mm. Here's some fucking. Because they're profiting off of it. Yeah, I I think the big pharma kind of conspiracy thing. It, it do, does get blown out of proportion a lot. In the age of capitalism, of course, they're going to make uh, a lot of money. And you know, as far as wait, lot, what's the conspiracy? You know, big pharma controlling the world, all of this. Right. But at the same time, whether well, they're just making money. Yeah. They just produce the drug people want. That's all it is. And AstraZeneca, uh, Pfizer, all of these who are now seen in a bad light are producing a lot of drugs that help save people's lives. And they're producing thousands, if not millions of jobs. Um, but then again, we get to this point where people go, oh, but you, we could get into a long debate about healthcare in countries like America. People go, oh, it's uh, Ben Carpenter, my friend who's got um, Crohn's disease. His costs of having to get the medication he needs in America are staggering. Like, is that an autoimmune disease? Crohn's yeah. disease? Yeah. So you've got uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, which a lot of people know about, George St. Pierre, yeah. Brock Lesnar. Yeah. Uh, Crohn's, I believe, is more severe. And do you know what? Uh, one of my ex-girlfriends had Crohn's before. And I didn't have to live with it, but I had to, have, I had to live with her living with it. And it's horrendous. Anywhere between the mouth and the arsehole, <laughs> you can get flare-ups. And yeah. just insane uh, pain uh, you get... Uh, ulcers that develop literally anywhere through the digestive tract. So it messes up your eating, it messes up your digestion. Everything. Yeah. And ben Carpenter, when uh, you see him, when he's at his list, he looks his best as if you're a bodybuilder because yeah. he literally can't absorb nutrients from food. Yeah, he's pretty lean. They go anemic. Uh, even his medication is subcutaneous, so he has to inject it into fat. Oh my God. Which is again another Sounds myriad, awful. Another myriad of issues because he's got no fat. So the nurse, <laughs> the nurse, so you think- Injected he, into your, oh, never mind. Yeah, so uh, I was watching a story the other day and uh, she 
got his leg and she was like, oh, there's no fat on here. I'm not sure we're going to inject. To lift up his top, he's peeled. Mm. And he... Because of the disease. Because of the disease. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis become anemic because they can't uh, take iron from food. Their, their ability to digest nutrients le- leaves them. And these kind of ulcers can develop and get so bad uh, where they need to have parts of their digestive tract removed. Oh my God. Uh, colons can be removed. You might have to use... Um, I'm trying to remember the word for the sack. Oh, yeah. like Colostomy. Where, yeah, Colostomy yeah, bags. Yeah. And only when living with someone who had that condition did I develop this empathy towards people. Uh, actually, funny enough, me and Cam were fucking around at the beach the other day. And Cam, big, strong lad, he was picking me up and throwing me in the water. And this woman came over and she goes, you lads look like you've got a bit of energy. Can you help us out? And we ended up helping a paraplegic woman into the water and back. And she had a colostomy bag. And I was thinking, fuck. I was like, like, you have it so tough. And uh, I actually rolled jiu-jitsu with a lad who had a colostomy bag who had Crohn's as well. No um, way. I never knew he had the bag. And I've been doing knee on belly. <laughs> he, never com- <laughs> he never complained once. Wow. And his, his Crohn's really degenerated. And there are so many people out there that are living with a crippling disease that can seem invisible from the outside. And so many people that are, uh, you know, having to use colostomy bags sometimes for years at a time. Some people can then get their digestive tract reconnected uh, to what's left of their colon so they can then have bowel movements again, but it's never yeah. the same. And the nature of autoimmune dis- uh, disorders are that largely you, there's no choice, a bit like type 1 diabetes, where there's a, I've tried to eradicate as much stigmatism towards, someone goes, oh, I'm diabetic. And someone goes, oh, you should take better care of yourself. No, 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 type 1, they don't have a yeah. choice. Yeah. And the same with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Even the toughest of people, it's a crippling condition. Yeah. This is, I think, the conversation we had is just being more appreciative of just what you have right now. Because I said, oh, Smith, we should book something for next week. You go, oh, tell me the day before. <laughs> I was like, what? that's not how you book things. You go, well, it's just, you know, I just try and enjoy every day more. And I was like, well, I could learn from this because I think so much planning and so much happiness we put off to the future, right? And we forget to appreciate just basic stuff in our day-to-day. And it's not until you have an experience where you have to bring a woman who's a paraplegic into the water that you have this small moment where you're like, fuck, I'm just so grateful for just what we have. And I've always said, I said to Ev, you know, what I've liked hanging out with you guys more is that because you live in essentially a holiday town, it's like you appreciate every day a lot more. You go down to the beach and they're like, Ferris will just stand there and he'll be like, how fucking good is today? I would not want to be anywhere else. And I go, you know what? Fucking right. This is sick. This is awesome. And I think that when you talk about autoimmune diseases, we're lucky we're in control of our health right now, you know? oh, we have a a bad night's sleep, we whinge about it, you know, because it was five hours, not six or whatever, you know, we go and make some changes. But imagine being stuck with something where it's like, it doesn't matter how good the food choice you have, whether it's organic, non-organic. Nah, if it's food, you ain't digesting it. Like you're in serious trouble here. You need to get a surgery. Like that's the feeling of helplessness that they must have for that. That makes you feel grateful. Mate, it's it's one of those things. Uh, It was funny, as we were lowering the woman into the water, Cam goes, be careful, it's a bit cold. She goes, I can't feel my legs. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and she was having banter with us. That's good. And like, I, I never wanted to ask. I never wanted to say what happened there. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Um, How old was she? Probably 30, 40. Okay. Um, and she was with her family as well. Um, and, you know, she had kids and probably what was a husband. But I was like, you know, me and Cam, we're, we're strong young lads. I was like, we'll, we'll do this. And it for a second, I was like, fuck. I was like, imagine having to ask or rely on people to do that. And I was, yeah. like, for, I was like, this is the least we can do. Um and fuck it, yeah, it does make you think. And I was like, you, you never know what's what's really around the corner. And it, I remember the ex that had Crohn's and the medication she had to take uh, was pretty shit where if she took it, I think it was methotrexate. I could have that completely wrong. Uh, and it's what, what type of drug is it? Is it's it? what people with the rheumatoid arthritis have to take as well. Yeah, okay. But she, so it's an anti-inflammatory drug? I'm not even sure if it's that. Okay. But if she, she took it once a week, which was, she was supposed to, she was wiped out the next day couldn't do anything so for one day a week she was fucked and then we had a lot of arguments when i caught her not taking her drugs then she had a flare-up and she got another type of medication for that and it meant she couldn't go out in the sun and it was the middle of summer so then we'd be down the beach and i'd find her pills mm. and i go yeah i'm taking it. we'd go to dinner i'd sit there <laughs> and i'd get her pills out i'd be like yeah i'm taking these today she but why like, would she not take them because it made her feel like shit right she just wanted to live a normal life mm. So then I'm having an argument where I want her to be healthy, but she wants to be normal. Mm. Whether she's in a stage of denial or not, then that got between us. Mm-hmm. And it was real hard because who's right? 
who gets to decide? I, yeah. I can't tell her what to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can st- I can passively aggressively bring a medication to dinner, <laughs> but, but I can't. I kick off in in, in public, <laughs> make a scene. But it's one of these things where there's so many considerations, and 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 people often wonder why you can get pissed off with people that aren't taking care of their health and and sometimes your underlying reasons are because some people are and they they have things that wipe them out george st pierre one of the best fighters ever to exist even brock lesnar who had a fantastic oh yeah ufc career yeah for a wwe guy yeah, yeah. Wi- wiped out by a condition and i think that sometimes i do want to slap people in the face who have got perfect bids of health that just aren't really doing much with it yeah and say like look like you don't have to be a saint because that's fucking boring mm. but improve where you're at yeah it's funny how people find, no matter how good they've got it, they always find a way to self-sabotage, you know? They always find a way to, no matter how famous I am, how much money I have, how good the people are in my life, they always find a way to give themselves a problem that they didn't need to give themselves. I was saying to uh, Willits, I'm just checking the battery, are we good? I was like, I was saying we're living in a degeneration nation. <laughs> we de- are. De- degenerates. Yeah, we've lost our purpose, you know? We don't have stuff to do and I'm sure you... I mean, you you said this recently, but for the last six weeks, and we were having this conversation, you found it hard to motivate yourself. You just felt lazy. You just didn't feel like there was much to do or whatever. Felt like shit. Yeah. And it's almost, and the worst part is, there's this social underlying tone that you can just be a fucking record at weekends. That's what Sundays are for. But then when it comes to Christmas, you can do it every day. And I've never been so sick of it as I am this year. <laughs> because what COVID's forced me to do is appreciate a lot of the smaller things. And when we're in lockdown, I watch more sunsets than I've ever seen in my life. And I did more exercise and I started eating better and all of this. And almost like what I what I think was a real tough pill to swallow is that in Australia, as things have eased back to give us more freedom, I've taken that freedom and used it in completely the wrong way. Mm. I've used it to just worsen my quality of life, to get yeah. pissed more, to go out more, to do stupid shit. And I was like, fuck. And I, it annoyed me, but also I feel that in Australia we're ahead. And what I want to do over the next few months is show people in the UK to not make the mistake I did. Because mm. I'm, at least I'm smart enough to see a trend when it's coming. I was like, fuck me. I had a year out of life, the longest holiday ever. And as soon as bars came back, I used it to get fucked up. Yeah. And it, it didn't benefit my net situation. Yeah. I find it interesting because the people that are close in your life that obviously make observations of what you're doing. I I get it because I'm like, well, you got to put yourself in your position, right? You're obviously very successful at what you've done. You've got a lot of disposable income. You've got a lot of time. If you were in, everyone has accountability because they have to work because they have a partner, a relationship. They have a mortgage. They have bills to pay or whatever. They have a structure in their life they can't really get away from because if they didn't, they'd starve to death, right? Or they'd get kicked out of the house or whatever a lot of those things have been taken away from you in, in some respects. So as a result, I'm like, no, 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 if you were in his situation, you'd be doing the exact same thing. If anything, you might be worse. You might actually not handle it well at all. And so I think that that's the piece that, that people miss. It's like, oh, I just want to be famous or I just want to you know, have all this money or whatever. I go, I don't know if you actually do because you're not the t- kind of personality that would handle it very well. And I, I don't think I would be either. I got a mate that loves to party and he goes, thank God I'm not rich and famous because it's like if I did, I would be dead. And I go, y- at least you're aware enough to know that. And I think that it's actually, in many ways, it's almost like, it's not like a privilege necessarily, but it's just like a you have a whole different set of problems. We talked about this, right? The other day, it's like, most people have these problems, you've got these problems. And they're just different problems to handle. But it's just, just because you swap the problems it doesn't mean you'd handle them better. Just because you're in his position doesn't mean you would do better. You'd be like, oh yeah, well, I wouldn't do that and I'd do this and do that. Go, no, you wouldn't. You don't when, know what you're like. When Duran comes out of quarantine, uh, I know we're on slightly different wavelengths at the moment, but Duran doesn't have the capacity to get fucked up like I do. Uh, I'm I'm good at it. I've, I've, <laughs> I've played, seen it. I've played rugby 15 years. <laughs> Mate, I've got about 16 photos of us in a club of you trying to get in the group but you just ended up facing the wrong way at dick height with your hands out almost like you wanted to get bukkake or something <laughs> bukkake <laughs> mate i am um, and uh I, i've realized what i've done in the last few weeks take a mental note of what really makes me happy i love producing a good video when i make content i i turn around my content about 15 minutes and i come running downstairs like a kid i'm like <laughs> fucking yes I've got an idea I've got the idea I get in there I'm in doing the idea I post it I see how well it's received I love that I love doing podcasts I love uh, exercising probably more than I like to realise I love being active uh, the other day I, I nipped out the house for like two hours I had boxing I skateboarded down I came back I burnt 1300 calories in two hours mm. and I was like fuck I'm, I'm actually pretty active mm. and 
but then I realized like, you know, I do like going out and I do like kind of doing stuff like that. But come the end of it, I was like, if I was to map out on paper where I would get most of my enjoyment, it's throughout the day. And by having these big sessions in the night or getting pissed at dinner or spending a stupid amount of money or whatever, the next day I just feel shit because of it. And I'm actually quite literally stealing happiness from the next day yeah. in a bid for something the night before. And it, what's going to be interesting over the next few months is seeing what gaps appear in my life from not being a degenerate <laughs> and how I fill them or what answers I try yeah. and get from them. And yeah, I've, it, it's it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it. And like I said to you, I was, I'm really kind of just shifting my priorities away from that into other things. And I suppose I could be growing up in the sense where I, I do like socially drinking, but I think that I've become a bit lost since we've had lockdown open up that I'm looking at nights out for happiness, Yeah, which is the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because like when you guys... I've never been a big drinker and then when I grew up and I was training, you know, I was doing competing in CrossFit, you know, you're training 20, 25 hours a week. You've got no room for drinking. There's no drinking culture in CrossFit like there is in rugby because there's nothing really to celebrate because you're just training the whole time and you've got one event in the year. Whereas rugby, you play every day. You can win a game, you score a try, epic, we'll go out, we'll drink, we'll celebrate. No, I just did four hours of fucking handstand push-ups and, and ring dips, you know? And then tomorrow I got to wake up and do a heavy set of back squats. Like, there's no time for partying in there. So for me, drinking always looked like, because I kind of skipped the drinking phase because I opened a gym when I was 20. It was one or two beers, max, max. And so I never really conditioned myself to be a good drinker. So then coming into your world and it's like, it's six beers to get started and it's midday. I'm like, I don't know if I can keep up with these guys. This is crazy. I don't think they can have one beer. And I was speaking about it with Cam and he goes, I have one beer and my immediate thought is, where's the next one? And I go, it's so funny you say that. I have one beer and I go, I could not have a second beer right now. Like I'm literally, completely, he goes, I get anxious. I want, I, he goes, I almost won't have the first beer unless I know there's three or four more next to it. I, I'm the same. I can't do it. I, I have a beer. I had a beer at lunch at Totties not too long ago. It ruined my day. I was like, because you wanted the next one. I was like, we're either drinking or we're not. I can't just have one and go away, because I, like I can't train, I can't exercise. I've now ruined my reactions if I want to play Call of Duty. Like, as soon as I've won, I need, I need to have more. And when people just have one beer at lunch, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like that. That seems that's to me. me like the idea of hell. <laughs> I can't enjoy just one. So yeah, I'm in the exact same place. And I was chatting to Darren about. It. He goes, why don't you just have a couple of beers? I go, you don't understand. I can't. But Darren comes from a place where he was aspiring to be a professional footballer. And I'm sure we'll have him on uh, when he's out of quarantine. He was at Bishop Tash and I'm pretty sure he went like three years without drinking mm. because his values were more in line with football. Yes. And it's very hard to become unprogrammed from that. Whereas I, I suppose I just came up in a different kind of setting and what I want to do now is just get get out of that habit. Yeah. Because I suppose it's, we're, we're very fortunate to be in Australia because we have so much to do that doesn't need to be boozy. Yeah. Yeah. I think what would be interesting is what I've noticed, because I'm very particular about my environments and I have like very, I'm very strict with what behaviors I do in certain environments so that my subconscious brain, when I step into the environment, it automatically knows what to do, right? I always make the example when you don't even need to piss. You go to the bathroom, you're like, oh shit, need the nail clippers. You li- just the sight of the white porcelain, you're like, oh, I need a, I need a fang of piss because your <laughs> subconscious knows yeah. every single time I see that white shape, I need to pee or I need to take a shit. And that's how powerful your subconscious is. So, when I walk into here, I'm like, we record and we get work done. But when I notice about your environment is you mix all the behaviors together. So for you, sometimes it's hard to work or it's hard to get into that mindset because 24 hours ago, we were drinking, having fun and partying. And that's why I think the separation of environments was why I was like, hey, come use the studio. Come use some office space. So you can just like switch off and just be more productive and get that stuff done. I think a lot of people need that, which is why they like gym so much. It's why people are sick of home workouts. Because like, all right, do a home workout and then I'm going to sit down and then I'm going to eat at this table. Then I'm going to work at this table. They're just over it. I think mixing of environments and behaviors is, is bad. And that's what um, James Clear talks about in his book. 100%. Like, uh, I can't work from home. At the moment, I can do emails on the sofa. But if I need to do stuff, I need to go to cafe. Need an environment to go into to do it. Um, I walked into the cafe this morning. Your headphones in just banging away at work. Yeah. I don't yeah. think I've ever seen you do that. Because <laughs> yeah. I'll do it on my own. I don't. I usually will just go somewhere, do my thing. And... That again, why I think people stick at home workouts. I, I could never train at home. Over the year, I had, uh, when I was younger, I had a barbell. I had 20s at home. Uh, I never used it. Bought mm. myself an Olympic weightlifting set. Never used it at home because I like going somewhere. I like taking my pre-workout. I like going there, whether it's coffee, whatever. When I walk in there, I get an email. That's not for now. 
that's for later. You get a text, I'll text you after. Same with the podcast, whatever it is. And it's really important for people to mix up those environments. Um, but some, a few people brought it up. They go, is your living situation what's causing this? I said, nah. I said, I'm the one leading the charge. <laughs> I'm the one <laughs> that's, that's there like, boys, let's go out this weekend. Yeah. Let's do this, let's do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just one of those decisions where I was like, I actually just want to be more health seeking. Mm. And it, it sounds like such a crazy thing. And actually when I'm more healthy, can I enjoy my food more? I actually worry about my composition less when I'm being healthy. Yeah. Um, it's more of a byproduct. Yeah. Whereas mate, when I when I get when I lost weight for my last jujitsu comp, I felt like shit. So like I want to just have a few good months of feeling good, and the productivity that you get from that, it's going to pay for everything. Oh yeah. Structure, it, mate, structure, routine, consistency, all all just the basic shit you just neglected for six weeks. Yeah, routine is not a good one. I uh, <laughs> yeah, I I. I get a bit of shit. I never check my diary. Do you think you're just adverse to routine? Like as a personality trait? I think it can, No, I used to be very organized when I was personal training on the gym floor. Yeah. So I had diary. And I think from four years of being, living in a diary, it's just nice to not have it anymore. Mm. A bit like I used to wake up at about 5.30 every day. Now I'm just like, when the, whenever I wake but up. Let, let's say you rented like an office or whatever. Say that, that office across the hall. And it was like, cool, you set it up. It's got a nice desk. It's got all the shit you need. It's got your fucking books there to inspire you. And it's like, cool, I come in here two days a week from these hours and I do this work. Do you think that would benefit you or do you think that would kill you? You think you'd be like, oh, I, I feel, I feel a bit, it. I feel a bit suffocated. Mm. Commitment issues. <laughs> it's only six month lease. That's my longest that's relationship. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, <laughs> right, we've got a seven month lease for you. Ooh, let's make ooh, it six. Ooh. Six uh, would be good. John, we're having uh, such a good uh, conversation here. I've got some kind of points. I'm, I'm actually probably going to get you in again in a couple of weeks time so like uh, what do we talk about fucking we got so Locker much room. to talk about I actually haven't given you a, a proper introduction yet so uh, we spoke about you being the co-host of your own podcast which have been on twice My Muscle Project uh, Jim O'Neill one of the by the way still today your first episode that we went on minus Raf not because Raf wasn't there still the number one most downloaded episode of 2000 and no of the last three years or two years Sick. two years yeah buzzing I'll, yeah. Take, I'll take that step. yeah 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 um, and that's again some serious guess as well big big guess I, I don't know what it is I, I, to this day I feel like I'm pulling off a big con <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I'm literally like people the, the fact I've got the downloads I do I'm like they're going to find me out one day <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you uh, you're a gym owner at the moment trainer at your gym Creature Fitness you're uh, soon to launch Locker Room yep uh, give the listeners Got the shirt on. Uh, yeah, a, an introduction. Probably only ten percent listeners are going to watch. So, uh, yeah, tell us tell us about locker room. Don't divulge anything that's going to be market se- secrets. No, no, it's all mostly out there anyway now. But essentially, I think natural entrepreneurship. I don't know if you feel like you relate to this, but you get bored easily. I'm my personality type, I get bored very quickly. And having the my longest commitment is my gyms. You know, nearly eight years and. It just felt like for a while that because I started business so young and I think you probably relate to this as well, you didn't have a destination in mind. You're just like, yeah, let's do it. Let's see how we go. And then as you get more successful, you're just like, oh, this is cool. Oh, this is good. Oh, more downloads or more money, more clients or whatever. But then we hit this point where I was like, you know what? I kind of see the finish line for these gyms. We're not going to be the next F45. I don't want to open more locations. I'm like, what do I really like here? One, I love working with high net worth clients. I don't know what it is. They're just, it's not, it's got almost nothing to do with money. They're just personality wise. They're wired, more, they're wired the same as you. Yeah. They're more fun. Uh, they get, they're just more productive. Uh, they're more, obviously more successful, but they, they want to be good at everything. They're very competitive. And I'm like, that's me. I fucking love that. So what? They're a bit older than me. It doesn't matter. But I'm like, this is, these are my people. So that was the first thing I identified. Second thing I identified is I want one gym. Although I had three at one point, I just didn't like spreading myself thin. It just wasn't the way I liked to do it. And some people like that. They like to have 10, 15 gyms, whatever. Maybe it's an ego thing. Maybe it's just how they want to make money. But I realized I'm like, you can just you can make the same if not better money from 10 locations with one if you have the right model. So that was another thing as I wanted one gym. And then the third thing was, and this was a kind of accumulation of a few different factors. So buying out some of our business partners, which I mentioned to you briefly and just sort of timing with the rest of the industry like group fitness is just so saturated yeah. if i see another group fitness spin-off i'm, I'm gonna neck myself i'm like this shit is the same thing don't doesn't matter if you go at forty thousand feet like, repackage it's so bad someone's yeah. there like 
Let's do it with altitude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's turn the lights off. It's yeah, like, fuck, come on, man. Like, let's let's put boxing gloves on. I'm like, look, let's just cut the shit. Like, we know the training that works, but how are we going to package this up correctly? And so, I ended up deciding, okay, what if I created... And now I took some inspiration from a few different gyms. One of the gyms was Dog Pound in the US. So, Dog Pound, one of the founding members, Hugh Jackman, uh, known across the world for training all the Victoria's Secret models. Uh, the Weekend raps about it sometimes in one of his songs. Um Justin Bieber trains there regularly, that sort of stuff. So I was like, what if, because Sydney's up and coming. I know it's still a holiday de- de- destination in your mind, but it's still, it's got that community. It's got, it doesn't have a lot of celebrities, but it's got enough people, enough professional athletes, enough super high net worth clients, you know, CEOs of banks, big founders of funds, all that sort of stuff to justify a gym like this. It didn't five years ago. I don't think it did five years ago, but now it definitely does. And I was like, why don't we just create a hub in Sydney, a gym that's specifically for these people. So I've just I've just coined them industry and business leaders. All that means is it's just someone that within their own company or organization or within their industry, they have they can exert a lot of influence. They they are they are looked to as a leader. So for example, in your space in fitness, uh, what other space would you put yourself in? What other industry? Author. Yeah, author books. You would be a leader. So like you would in in theory qualify as someone for that gym. And we wanted to make it exclusive. So we just made it. We opened up essentially 100 memberships only for this gym. The idea is that there are a lot of problems we saw with these clients. They can afford, they can basically pay their way out of anything. If they want to lie down on a plane, they can pay for it. If they want, you know, three degree marbled steak on a plane, they can pay for it. You know, if they want a gold Rolex, they can pay for it. All these sort of things that they can pay for. But ultimately what they love paying for is conveniences, right? Things that are going to make them more productive and get them towards their goals faster. But one thing that they couldn't buy was a better fitness service. Even if they had the best PT at Fitness First or Fitness Still First, got a queue for the Titanium, press. exactly, right? Titanium Fitness First, $300 an hour for this PT. It's got seven degrees and PhDs in human biomechanics. They would still rock up at 6 a.m. or whatever the time is, pack gym, bench taken, the intern that gets the train, that gets $50,000 a year, their secretary, they're on the bike. The trainer looks at them and goes, well, looks like I'm going to stretch you out on the fucking mat in the Pilates room, you know? And they're like, well, fuck, I can pay for this, you know? Or they go into the change room, all the showers are taken or I don't know, they don't have their own locker or someone's stolen their shit. Like, they're like, I can, I can afford to do better than this. And we just thought, okay, let's just create a gym where it's like, okay, you're always going to get your program. You're going to get really good training. You're going to be surrounded by like-minded people because one of the other complaints is people know who they are. So they go to a class and they're like, oh, mate, uh, let me get your LinkedIn and, you know, I've got this deal or this fund you should look at or do you want to invest in my company? And they're like, fuck off. You know, yeah, like, I mean, I'm, just here, I'm just here to do a workout. Stop harassing me. So I'm like, what if, no one's going to harass you if you're surrounded by other people like you or if someone comes up to you and they want to invest but they're worth $500 million, then you're like, cool, let's invest. You know what I mean? So I wanted to create a hub like that selfishly because it'd be a cool place. I basically say, if you're in this community, you can't lose. You might not win, but you can't lose. Like you're going to look after each other there. And what if you need a network for certain things at certain points in your life? I know you're one of those people who's like, oh, I don't invest any money or whatever. But if I turned around and you met this guy and you trained with him and he's like, mate, just give me $100,000 and in 10 years, you don't have to work again because the interest off what I'll get you, you don't have to worry about it. Even if you never sell another book or, you ne- or your app dies or whatever, or you, you turn off social media, they, they ban you forever. If you've got <laughs> this in my fund, if you got this in my fund and you pay my fees off the interest, you don't have to ever work again. Just simple stuff like that, right? And you go, fuck, that's awesome because I got that gym. I got that opportunity. Or you invested in some company or you met this person or it's whatever. There's going to be a lot of personal trainers listening going, fucking hell, notepad out. <laughs> it's too late. You need a lot of money to open this gym. Um, so yeah, we're like two, three weeks away from opening it. Um, pretty fucking excited. It's going to be sick. It won't be anything that, there won't be equipment or training in there that you've never seen before. But the way it's structured and the operations and the model, it's going to be sick. It's fucking expensive as well. It's, uh, it's interesting because like, a gym's equipment is important, but it's not the be all and end all. And actually, you go to Kingdom in Freshwater, uh, amazing facilities. Yeah. There's like eight leg presses. Yeah. Eight different leg presses, but how many people are actually working a program that's got progressive overload? Or how many are just going on and going, oh, I've got, got the burn, bro. Yeah. That's where the gains are made, <laughs> yeah. bro. Uh, and again, it's actually funny. You called me out the second we got in here and I set up the camera for YouTube. You were like, you should have two cameras. You should have someone else editing that. You yeah, should yeah. have. And again, for me, I would call myself a pretty decent level podcaster, audio technician, <laughs> social media content creator. Straight away, you're like, you should be getting someone else to do that. You should be doing this, blah, blah, blah. But people are just so, they, they want to keep things the way they are. 
but really change is where the growth really occurs. I think yeah. people need to appreciate that. and also offloading and delegating stuff has been probably one of my best things I've done in the last few years. Yeah. And I think that for people that there there is a bit of a stigma with personal trainers, but offloading something that someone can do a better job at mm. is often essential. It's yeah. a prerequisite, it's something that should be done by people. I think you don't do a lot of things because subconsciously you don't want to do the work that's involved in getting that thing. Even though you want to put out, say, four videos a day and a podcast a week, you don't do it because you're like, oh, I don't really want to do all that editing and that work. And that's fair. Like maybe you're at that point where it's like, I'm the talent. I don't want to do all the back end work. Or no, it's the opposite. I love doing it. Cause oh, when, you do like doing it? Yeah, I, I love doing the edits. So when it goes out, it's it's more of a case of like, I don't want to give it to someone else. There's a chance it could be better. Wait, for your videos or for your podcasts? Everything. Okay. Because I, I do all the editing to everything. I, it's a control thing. Mm. Um, as far Sonny's as- Sonny's got that problem as well. Yeah. yeah. I, ju I just love being a creator. Yeah, yeah. I love putting it out and- if I was to give someone else a video and they got the jump cuts wrong, I'd be like, oh, you fucking mm. Um And I also quite like the fact that I don't have an intro beat. I don't have something that's like, you know, do -do 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 the James Smith pot. I just, I like things being a bit raw. Yeah. I think if they were edited, they'd be a bit too much. Mm. Um, interesting enough in the show notes as well, I put the weirdly, we, we became acquaintances through business, through the podcast, but now we're mates. Mm. So it's it's an interesting kind of upgrade. One. I said this to you. I don't, it was probably a few weeks ago. I said this to Cam. I go, am I a dick if I said this? We were sat on the sofa. I go, I actually quite like your company. <laughs> and I, Did say that. I was like, uh, I I didn't realize how clicky British people are in Australia. Yeah, we're we're tough because the way we communicate and our banter is very different to anywhere else. Yeah. So my, my one of my highest compliments to you is how well you fit in with the British click. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because when we started hanging out and I, I wasn't posting anything, but obviously by association, people were like, oh, you're hanging out with them now, like putting a good word for me. Let us know where you're going next. Like we'll hang out or whatever. And I go, look, it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> I'm like, just because I'm hanging out with them now doesn't mean that now all this other side of my network gets permission to come hang out with them. Like imagine if we went out for beers and then I'm like, oh boys, yeah, yeah, come over here. Oh yeah, James, you know, why have you bought 16 mates to come meet James Smith? I'm like, no, it doesn't really work like that. If they want you to hang out, they can have you hang out. But it's a, it's a hard group to crack. It's not that you're bad guys. I think that's just because you're very happy where you guys are at. You don't need anyone to add anything to your group. You don't. You're like, the, there's plenty of fun between the four of you or the five, six, seven, however big you say your network is. But literally, I was just like, well, Cam's training at the gym. Cam's cool to hang out with. We train sometimes or whatever. And then one morning, like no intentions, I was like, hey, Cam, let's get a breakfast. Like I, you train in my gym. I don't really know much about you or whatever. I just know James and lives with you and whatever. And then I think I rolled in and you guys were like half hungover, half watching Top Gear. And then we're just chilling out. And then that's when you said we're having sushi and you go, yeah, don't take this the wrong way. But yeah, I was super hesitant that we were hanging out today. I was like, okay. I was getting judged the whole time. But you I was like, like, you can stay. Cam was like, Lucky's coming around. I was like, you're bringing someone into the click? Yeah. I was like, you're bringing someone into our click? Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, a uh, testament to that. I think that's the highest compliment anyone can ever receive. When Duran gets out here, you'll be interested. Me and him, I've, the reason we're such good mates is we're on such the same wavelength. We even shit and piss at the same time. We get hungry at the same time. Also, when we work. like, um, Do you think he makes you more productive at what you do? Yeah. Because it's competitive, right? Uh, yeah, and also yeah. Uh, when we wake up, straight away we want we want to clear everything. We want to get everything kind of out of the way. We want to get on top of work. That's like the main thing. And then when we're producing content, I actually I called him yesterday for about an hour. I said, Darren, I'm excited to hold the camera for him when he wants to make content because then he can hold the camera for me, and we both know exactly what we want. It's very give take. And uh, I need a Darren. Yeah, everyone <laughs> everyone needs a Darren. And um, the, the the funniest thing is every time we're having conversations, most of the times so we're talking about anything serious, he'll just he'll be like, I oh, know. And then I'm like, yeah, but I'll, he'll be like, I know. And you need people like that. Mm. I said to him today, I was like, uh, we had to talk kind of uh, finances, for some of our business stuff. He's like, I don't care. I was like, but I started the conversation going, Darren, I know you don't care, but this. He goes, I don't care. I, went, I know you don't care, but this is how it is. He goes, it's calm, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're always on that same wavelength. That's good. Do uh, do, Business-wise, you guys help each other out? I mean, obviously you post about each other and stuff, but you, because like, you know, one of the things that I've noticed with us is, in isolation, you and I will talk about our businesses, but in the group, it's something that we won't really talk about. We'll, we'll just we'll just banter, right? People don't really care. My the other mates don't really care. I think that's the the main reason. But yeah, it, I think they do though. They I think they do, but uh, in I think they're in, interested. Yeah, they're interested, but uh, not 
not really uh, a kind of higher level, but with Duran, Duran was uh, a key component of my early day success. Uh, and he like, worked for you, right? Yeah, he was yeah. my right hand man for a long time. And then I was very supportive when he wanted to do his own thing, because ultimately, if he does well, he's going to buy more dinners. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Like you know, that, that's you're going to get nicer gifts for Christmas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, as far as things like that, I think is it's always good. I've always been very happy to see his success, uh, and also. James Shaw, my business partner, is also one of his best friends. Yes. So we were in this little like a uh, triage uh, of, of friends there. But yeah, we'll always, if you need help with anything, we'll sit down. Uh, and then he levels up. His editing at the moment is better than mine. Then he'll help me with some like audio stuff. And it's always just having that kind of partnership where even though we're on different agendas, um, you know, he enables me very much. There are a lot of things going on in my life that don't feel like work because of his companionship. Mm. So for our Brisbane event coming up, with things as they stand, I might have to get out of Sydney for two weeks. So me and Darren and I can now just fuck off to like rural New South Wales, find a town that's got jiu-jitsu, do it, and then apply yeah. it across the border to Brisbane. Yeah. And I said to him, I was like, can you imagine what this would be like if I had to do this on my own? Yeah. So it's one of those things where, you know, Darren will be opening all the shows as well. In the last mm. tour, he fucking roasted me. <laughs> like to the point, the roasts got worse as the tour went on. By the time we hit London Live, I had my family there. My sister was oh, there. Oh, no. And he was roasting me. I'm laughing. I'm pissing myself. And when there are new bits in the roast, I was like, this is amazing. That's good. But yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those companionships, which I think that a lot of people, um, a lot of people really need. Uh, Definitely. I've got some bits on the show notes. I'm, I'm only concerned about that battery. We've still got, I think we might even have half, if not. Yeah, it's half. Oh, sick. We got loads of time in. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, uh, I've got a few things here. First of all, we touched on it earlier. 2020 has been this weird year where, or had been that weird year. We could not quantify how much had happened in a year. Yeah, we were trying to, we were sitting in the park trying to, <laughs> trying to break it down. I was going, no, 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 no. That was two years ago. And you were going, no, no, no. That was early this year. Two book launches in 2020 for me. And you were like, no, no, no. I'm year still before. running it back in my mind going, what are you? Sh so you definitely didn't have a book the first time I no. interviewed you. It would have been November 2019. I think it was October. Yeah, okay, 2019. October. You definitely went. So when did the first book come out? January 25th, 2020. That's mad. So less than a year ago. That's mad. So for any listeners listening to this, not a diet book was not out a year ago. Yeah, it's crazy. And then, do you know what freaks me out is, you know on the camera roll, you can hard press on the right and scroll through all your photos yes. up and down. There's so much that has happened in my camera roll s since lockdown. And I'm like, wow, how is that much on my camera roll since the last time I could travel freely? Mm. It's mad. It's mad. It's almost like human brains can't compute it. And I still think that everyone thinks March last year was the year before. Or wasn't that longer? Everyone's losing yeah. track of where it is. Yeah, it's it's just altered. That's the whole theory of relativity, right? It's just altered our perception of time because we were on this. Like I think talked about just this agreed upon cadence of what a year should feel like and how much you can get done. Agreed upon cadence. I love yeah. that. Yeah, it's now completely gone out the window. Now we've got oh, you can get this much done in this much time, and you can actually have a work day that's like. 20% work and 80% leisure and you can work a four-day week and get more done. It's mad from home. And I loved uh, Sam Harris where he talks about so many people are resting upon 2021 to do a lot for them. But yeah, crippling economies, poor leadership, coronavirus, all these things don't care about the Gregorian calendar year. And I think a lot of people are going to be upset when they realize the end of January is only three weeks away, not even. Mm. The year change does nothing for you. Yeah. We, I, I'm, I really hope that a lot of people aren't resting on the laurels of a calendar year to, your know, coronavirus doesn't care about what year it is. Mm. You know, uproar in America, you know, China's growth, <laughs> dominance, yeah. all these things. They're like, none of these things are really tied into the calendar. And I think a lot of people need to realize that they can't lean on 2021 to be a fresh year. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I said, uh, you know, the, I guess, standard expected New Year's post. I basically just have well-detailed plans held loosely because... You can't have any expectation of anything happening. And surely you, you can't think that going from December 31st to January 1 is going to change that. It's the same. Like, it, we might lock down again. It's a very real possibility. Our plans to open locker room might, might get thrown out the window. I have to be ready for that. And I think that people just have this expectation. But because it's January 2021, there's a one, not a zero there. The rules are different. Yeah, things are going to be different. It could be worse. Yeah. It could be fucking worse. Maybe the worst is yet to come. You know, which we is go, 2020 <laughs> was so good. <laughs> at least we Take could go back. Off, at least we could leave our bedroom and use the front room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Like, no, oh, I'm stuck to having sex with people only in my house. <laughs> <laughs> you saw that BBC article, right? Oh, fuck me. BBC, you fucking wear a mask whilst having sex. Only have sex with people in your own house. What, you're supposed to start fucking your family members? <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. And That'd be good for Fez. Who's it for fucking yeah, it would be good for Fez. <laughs> Who the fuck is going to wear a mask having sex? You'd rather have coronavirus. Well, look, this is... So when Ev, my partner, she got the coronavirus this year, one of very few people in Australia, I said to her, the second it happened, so we get the call from New South Wales Health. Okay, so where are you guys? What's your apartment living situation? We're like, all right, two-bedroom apartment, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here's the protocol. You need to move your bedroom or you need to move a sleeping situation into bedroom two. You are now in bedroom two. She's going to be in bedroom one. In your living quarters, spend no longer than five minutes together in the living quarters a day. Stand at opposite ends of the room. Wear a mask. In, how many bathrooms do you have? Like one bathroom there. Okay, in between bathrooms, bleach, sanitizer, spray, air freshener. I was like, okay, yep, yep, yep. Hung up the phone. I go to Ev, I go, cool. This is what he just said. I go, I will have a mental health disorder at the end of this three weeks if I do all those things. If I'm looking at you from the room with a mask, <laughs> with a bleach in one hand, with gloves on and a mask, and I'm trying to tell you how my day was because I've been stuck in the second bedroom, I go, nah, let's come here. Give me a kiss. Give me this fucking virus. <laughs> Let's get through I was it. like, cough on me. I'm like, if you're getting it, I'm getting it. I'm like, because I just, it's just not going to work. At least you could be all together. Right. And just lay in bed and just be like, oh, I feel like death. Me yeah. too. Oh, I can't on. breathe. <laughs> I need oxygen. <laughs> then we wouldn't be speaking anyway. Mate, it's, uh, it, it's crazy actually. Like, uh, it's, it's, it, so I actually know some, a lot of my fitness friends that are really fitness were fucked by it. Yeah, okay. So your mate, Paul. Paul, Lee, Paul Lima. He almost died, right? Nah, I think that was a bit dramatic, but okay. he, I think he needed uh, he needed an ambulance. <laughs> but, that's, pretty, that's, that's pretty bad. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad to need oxygen like that. Um, um, but he wasn't almost dead. Nah. Okay. Well, he might have been if he didn't, <laughs> didn't get the ambulance. But he's he's arguably one of the, like, you know, an incredible shape. Like, Is it the vitamin D thing that Robert you know Patrick what? spoke about? I think it could be. Uh, I think that uh, I could be being very ignorant here, but people of dark skin... Uh, often are more likely to be vitamin D deficient. If they live in the Northern Hemisphere. If they, yeah, and live in parts of the world. Uh, you know, he's Nigerian descendancy, uh, grew up in Ireland. And, you know, the vitamin D, I think, is a, for immune system, irregardless. Yeah. It's a very, very important thing. Um, also having a young daughter, two young daughters, well, two young daughters, sleep deprivation, all of these kind of factors, middle of winter. It was like a perfect storm for yeah. him to, to get it. And thank God he's, he's all right and he's back. Uh, and he's made light of the situation as well, but you know, it's it, we we joke about it. When I saw that he was in kind of that ill bit of health, that's when I made the vaccine video the week later. Mm. Well, I was like, I I saw a friend of mine, a gym owner, who put a poll up saying who's getting the vaccine, and eighty five percent of people said no. And I was out like, of how many votes? Hundreds? Out of hundred, the the Instagram stories one. So eighty five percent said no, and I was like, probably hundreds of votes. Probably, yeah, and I was like, fuck me, I was like, how stupid are people being? in the United Kingdom. And I was like, do you know what? Because the worst thing is there are going to be other fitness people out there who think they're better than coronavirus. And if you have enough people of those, you can then overhaul the fucking health system. Yeah. And, you know, this is something we should be avoiding. If the vaccine has got a high percentage success rate, then people should be taking it. And I mean, I only filled my mind with actual studies and people way smarter than me what they were saying. Mm. Social. I never once took anything from social media. I literally went away. I looked at efficacy of studies, the mechanisms behind how they work, and even how they were developed and what kind of technology was used. And the funny thing is that if vaccines fuck you up, they fuck you up in a very quick period of time. Like apparently, this type of vaccine, I could be wrong. Like uh, your react, your negative reaction to it is almost instantaneous. Yes, yeah. right. and so that actually makes it quite easy to do trials on right. vaccines because if after three weeks they're fine. The vaccine's done its job yeah. and they're all right. Yeah. And I do understand that the first doctor to take a vaccine and die, maybe, the, the coroner are looking at it recently. One of these new vaccines. Yeah. He took it and died. Yeah, but they're still trying to determine whether or not it's the vaccine that did it. Okay. Then if you look at the hundreds and thousands of doctors that have, and healthcare workers that have taken it, yeah. you can't let one death spoil the entire thing. Even yeah, of course. Similarly to fucking peanuts. How many kids died taking peanuts in sure. the last few years? Yeah. yeah, there's no one, well, we need to get these out of circulation. Yeah. It's unfortunately just the statistics. And again, the way people rile statistics for the narrative, you know, someone could say, four million children died of famine this year. Well, that's great because it was 12 million 10 years ago. You yeah. know, And the way people put this data forward is, the scaremongering of it is, is crazy. And I think that uh, in the UK, one in 30 people in London got coronavirus now i think one in 50 across the country 
And, Crazy. And it, you have to get the vaccine. Yeah. It's not even it's not even an option anymore. The thing is, if you if three weeks after the UK lockdown, let's say March, April, whenever it was, if you dropped a vaccine then, people would have just taken it. Yeah. People have had enough time to create fear, scaremongering and hoax videos or whatever. <laughs> it's like surely the requirement and want for this over time should have got higher. Yeah, it's got lower. It's and bad. Like, people are more worried about the vaccine than coronavirus. Well, and Sam said distribution issues. He goes, we know, we knew that we were going to get a vaccine. We knew we were going to have to distribute it amongst a population that was sick. And yet now we have arrived with a vaccine in record time and the distribution network hasn't arrived. What are we doing? What the fuck are we waiting for? Like, it's, it's, it's crazy. And he said in that podcast, he goes, if you believe that, you know, vaccines rot your organs, if you, you're in a cult, he goes, if you believe that Black Lives Matter was started from, you know, right-wing fascists or whatever, it's like, you're in a cult. And he was saying all these things of all these beliefs that have popped up in 2020. He goes, you're in a cult, you're in a cult, you're in a cult. You don't even realize it. You're in this echo chamber of these people that are touting fake information, he said, fake uh, beliefs. One of the things he said that was amazing was he goes, if you think that someone of a, let's say someone with black skin goes to a job interview who's qualified and you think they're not getting that based on their skin type, you're in a cult. Mm. And it's crazy, the statistics, even uh, I saw a really good one, Jordan Peterson uh, was up against a feminist. And she was like, well, men have the most wealth, you know, men have this, men have that. We're in a male to side, but dominant industry. He goes, more men commit suicide, more men are in jail, more men have this, more men have that. And he pulled out all the counter opposite statistics. Which you never hear about. Yeah. And he goes, you've decided the narrative that you wanted to present to me and it's not fair. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the times, you know, there are, even Sam Harris was very brave with the statistics he brought to the market of you're more likely to be, what type of skin type is more likely to be shot? What like skin type is that, more likely to be Can we come back from the brink, that episode? Yeah. That's all, yeah. And he yeah. goes, you know, uh, we're, we're living in a world, that's not going to go TikTok viral. You know, and unfortunately putting a, uh, you know, a white person being shot by a police officer in his car, uh, you know, that one's not going to get traction. Yeah. And because it doesn't serve their narrative of what they're looking to talk about. And yeah, it's, it's been a mad old year, but there's still so much shit. Well, we're inherently, we're born emotional creatures. We stay emotional and we develop rationality and logic the older we get. But our core is emotion. That's why everything we, we, we make decisions is based off emotion. And then we use rationale and logic to justify it later. Not always, but in most cases we do. But it's not serving us well right now. You know, if someone dies from a vaccine and it's your family member, Imagine if your dad took the vaccine and he died. And they're like, yeah, it was because of the vaccine. There was some more immune thing that we didn't realize and it crossed with his DNA and he died. And then me telling you that vaccines are okay. You would have a hard time. Yeah. You're two, the two areas of your brain fighting against each other. Logically, you know, he's probably right. Look at the studies, look at the research. My dad fucking died from the vaccine. Fuck you. And that's how, that's how this, whole, this whole year has been with some, the voting, with some, everything. Someone said to me, they go, you're spitting on the grave of every child who's died from a vaccine in the last 10 years. And I went, it's like telling me never to get in a car because people die in car Never crashes. get in the pool. Yeah, never get in a swimming pool. Never, yeah. go, never swim in Bondi. Yeah. A lot of people drown in Bondi yeah, each year. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking, it's mad. But social media as well, in the early days, it fucked people by putting so many good physiques into a world where not many people have those physiques. Social media. Yeah. Yeah. And Instagram. now we're, we're seeing it in other things. Like the fact Trump has now been censored even from pinterest he censored from pinterest yeah i don't even think he uses pinterest <laughs> Pinterest there trying to get right hey we'll fucking ban him as well you know they just want some pinterest. fucking exposure <laughs> pinterest he's gonna we there. still have users yeah he's still gonna be there pinning for the democratic <laughs> party pinning posts of fucking shit republican uh yeah sorry republican. yeah yeah biden's the old democratic he yeah i mean the thing about trump is like it's almost the, the same emotional rational thing right rational thing part of your brain Probably not voter fraud. In fact, it's been proven. There's no voter fraud. But you're a Trump supporter and he lost. Ah, there's going to be voter fraud. It was like, well, there's actually no proof of this voter fraud. Yeah, but I'm emotional because Trump lost and I was team Trump. It's interesting because there is always some degree of voter fraud because uh, I think Joe Rogan said it best where he was like, you've got an elderly couple, the husband dies, and the wife puts in two ballots because she knew what her husband wanted to vote for. Oh, no, yeah. well, how can he vote though? He's dead. Well, like uh, they're saying that she could just, you know, sign his off, take it in there, uh, you know, say that he's still alive, not report the deaths. Like things can slip through. Right. Okay. Like even if it didn't, she she is committing fraud. Even if they clock it. Yeah. Yeah. You I know guess. what they're gonna do? <laughs> fucking fine her, send her to yeah. jail. She's like, oh, you know, Albert really <laughs> wanted the Democrats to win, yeah, so yeah. I've signed his. Vote. I don't know why she sounds like that. She's American, <laughs> but like you know, and so there is fraud uh, of some respects happening. But I'm sure not 
of the level of what she was doing. Not that could move the needle. Did you see um, there's a documentary on whether or not Trump was fit for presidency? From a lot of psychologists spotted from the outset the type of narcissist he is, dishonest, and they like. I think there's like four thousand published lies that they've actually been like. This is objectively not true. The guy wasn't fit for the for the job. Personally, like you know, uh, it's quite interesting. If he had just not done anything after the election, he could have gone for cover- governor of California. <laughs> Probably, mate, because no one wants that job right now. The amount of people oh, yeah, that yeah. leave in California. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Again, Sam Harris talking about... Um, yeah, the one, 50% of the state's revenue is isolated to 1% of the earners. Of the earners. And a lot of them are leaving. Elon Musk is leaving, isn't it? Yeah. Well, think about how many jobs the Tesla factory creates and how much money and revenue they produce. And taxes are so high in California. Let's say... Well, he's the richest man in the world now. Let's say Tesla in California is worth $5 billion dollars. What forty percent of that? Two billion is is essentially tax money. Two billion dollars of state revenue. That's insane from one person making one decision. That's going, he's going to Texas, isn't he? He's in Texas. I think Texas is going to become the new like California. Have you been to Texas? No. Nah. Went to Austin, two thousand nine, when we could still travel. One of the best experiences that I had. So I went to Onnit headquarters out there. Met Aubrey. Met the whole team out there. Met like Primal Spolger, the kettlebell guy, and all that sort of stuff. That is one of the coolest facilities I have ever been to. Amazing community. Just, just a bunch of. It's almost like you took all these free spirited people, entrepreneurs, and just put them in one hub, and you went there. And this guy's like, oh yeah, I do like reconstructive brain surgery and and like I also swing kettlebells and one guy's like oh yeah I have the largest um, I don't know hair replacement franchise in the world and I also swing maces and it's just like this weird mix of because they're attracted to Aubrey's psychedelic loose spiritual side but also his business success so they want to be around you know a guy that built 150 million dollar company and you know off a pill of alpha brain and so I was sitting in the sauna speaking to all these guys, hearing about their stories after the training session. We did like a class and I was like, he's created something special here. And I think a lot of, because people are saying a lot of what Texas is like, especially um, where we were is in, in Austin is like that. Community. Big hub for entrepreneurs. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Um, I still haven't forgiven you for the six day doms you gave me last week. <laughs> six day doms. I, I, I train with Lucky. That's because right? you don't fucking do legs, bro. Yeah, I haven't You don't do any weights. Yeah, but the thing is, one, my legs look good they're all fart no poo at the moment right and with jiu-jitsu I've been very much jiu-jitsu is horrible when you've got leg doms because people would also like, tight you need to be loose through the hips right yeah yeah. and being people knee cutting across the doms quad doms <laughs> and I text him right and it's quite funny for I go lucky mate my legs still hurt you go James you're a fucking PT <laughs> <laughs> I got no sympathy bro <laughs> yeah I was like yeah you should have known it was coming bro and like, to be fair it was about 30 squats with 25 kilos mate they were <laughs> zercher loaded <laughs> 35 kilogram ball lunges on the minute every minute and they were not kind it was it wasn't that bad I, you know to be fair I was pretty sore as well so I knew I knew then it was it was, <laughs> it was gonna be bad for you I was like oh I'm feeling this one and I was going through my head who else would be feeling this oh yeah the guy that doesn't fucking lift weights anymore <laughs> message guy, you straight the guy away the just been pissed the whole of Christmas <laughs> oh fuck why do you think you haven't lifted any weights just not interesting to you uh, I just uh, wanna have I wanna make sure that I've got enough energy in reserve for Jiu Jitsu I like performing. It's your priority. Yeah, hundred percent. But you don't think it would make you better at jujitsu? Uh, yeah, I I know objectively they would protect me from injuries and things like that. I think that probably where I've not been looking after myself as much. I know I've got less energy reserves, so it's more about like the concurrent training, getting things like in order. I want to save everything for that. It's another reason why I do want to clean up my act a bit so I can start doing more resistance training, do more running, do more aerobic stuff. Uh, I've got swimming later on this morning, which I want to get back into. Because you can get away really with jujitsu being a bit, yeah. Like you can lie on your back and just defend, right? Yeah. But if you got a sprint on an assault bike, you got a sprint. Yeah. You know. And I want to mix it up a bit. I just really want to start pushing the boundaries a bit more. I want to start uh, taking twenty twenty one a bit more seriously and make it a bit more work focused. Well, you want to do a marathon? Is that what you say? No, I'm not doing a marathon. <laughs> I did a half marathon with like not any structured training. But so you want to do a marathon is what you say? <laughs> well, I might just consider it, bro. I might, I might. I'll do it with you. I might consider it later on when I get my base, base fitness. Yeah, do that. But um, in essence, I, I I kind of came to a bit of a realization that this year, if I give myself a year, I can accomplish a lot. Like a, I kind of felt like this year everyone had the year off, and even though I know it's only an arbitrary number, twenty twenty one, I was like, I really want to give this year a go, and I feel like uh, I've seen like a little gap in the market. Which I think no one else is really going for. 
I think it's just an interesting time to go for it. More podcasts, more more guests, more just do more work. A gap in the market to work more. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, to put more content out. No one, uh, a lot of people think Instagram's dead at the moment because they're not getting growth. The reason for that is they're still doing the same thing mm. and it needs to change. They're and not we, innovating. Yeah, we spoke a bit before about Facebook being such a powerful tool Yeah, because no one, everyone's values are wrong. They put stuff on Facebook, they don't get as many likes. You can't double tap on Facebook for a start. Mm. So people's intuition, oh, that was good. Mm. They don't get it. So they suddenly think it's useless. Mm. But if people put their values into Google Analytics and where did you search? Because I told you about the Insta Facebook thing. Where did you check your metrics? I don't know wherever we check metrics, but yeah, instantly we looked at Facebook and we go, oh shit, Facebook is where we're getting most of our reach, which is interesting because you don't think that because it's like I related it to running gyms and creating gyms, right? When you build the gym from the perspective of what do I think would be cool because what do I want, you have a shit gym, right? Or you just bring in everyone that's like you and that's not always a good thing. But if you think of it from what kind of customer, what kind of person do I want to attract, where are they? If they're on Facebook, go to Facebook. If they're on YouTube, go to YouTube. If they're on Snapchat, if they're on whatever. But if you just like using Instagram because you think Instagram's cool and you want to be Insta famous and you put all your content out there, it might not actually be the kind of person you need to build a business. It's like when you create content, you've got it in the back of your mind. Okay, is this going to get me an email? Is this going to get me a sign up? But most people when they're posting, they're thinking, how many likes can I get? Just, just purely for the sake of getting likes. You, If you got one like on a photo, but it made you a million dollars based off how many people sign up to the app, you wouldn't give a fuck. Yeah, you, you, can't, fuck. you can't buy steak with likes. I've always exactly. said it. Well, Paul Mott said it first, but uh, it's, it's one of those things where I think people have just got really poor values towards a lot of things. And yeah. there's another reason that I wrote, not a life coach, but um, it's, yeah, it's an interesting one. It'll be interesting to see how the year goes. I'm interested to have more conversations as it goes along. Yeah, um, me too. We're coming up to two hours. So, right. wow. Yeah. Wow. Anyway. So we're, we're going to uh, knock it on the head there. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Any You're Any closing s- sentiments? Man, probably the only thing I'd say is if you miss hearing health and fitness information because you just are so sick of talking about it, we still talk about it on our show. So if you want to, if you want to get um, health and fitness related content, it's uh, along a similar vein. No bullshit. We call people out. Yeah, we only get on guests that speak the truth. And if I didn't like his podcast, I wouldn't have gotten it twice. So there there's the endorsement. <laughs> the My Muscle Project. Project he means. <laughs> Lucky. Cheers for coming Thanks, on, mate. mate. Cheers. Thank you.